Okay, let's see. Huh. Hello, wonderful people. Um, I'm still trying to figure out how this is going to sound. I'm sorry for the delay. Uh, it's basically the microphone problem. This, as you can see, is a new thing that I bought recently. Um, and it's not plain or long. And unfortunately, I don't know what's wrong with it. Anyway, hello! A lot of you have been complaining about that funny uh, thumbnail that has me going like this. And some of you said it was kind of scary. My apologies. I just thought I'd try something different. Um, so, what time is it now? Perfect, it's 11.55 local. How is everyone doing? Where are you guys all coming from? Um, I see there's a lot of comments. I'm gonna try to read as much as I can. As you probably know, it, uh, the eclipse itself doesn't start for, I think, another two hours, at least in some of the uh, western parts of the US. And um, we're just going to basically chat for now. I, I, actually, I actually have a bunch of stuff I wanted to cover as well, just random facts about eclipses that most people probably don't actually know, uh, but I personally have never seen them myself. There's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of phenomena that happen during the eclipse. And, um, ooh, I can hear myself. From where? From here. That's not good. Um, and yeah, so we're just gonna talk and chat. First of all, thank you so much for, what is this? 20 subscriptions from, uh, oh, I don't see your full name. The house of, whose house is this? Oh, I'm so sorry, I cannot see your full name. Thank you for the uh, 20 subscriptions, that's awesome. Um, and basically what, what we're gonna do today is we're just gonna hopefully have fun together. Hopefully I'll get to answer a lot of questions I did not get to answer for like almost over, I think it's actually, it's been a year since I did my last stream. And that was, that was during the announcements of the, um, announcements of the black hole image from Sagittarius A star. Since then, I kept promising, we're going to have another stream soon. We're going to do another one soon. And uh, yeah, life gets in the way, you know. And with daily videos, it's a little bit challenging. My apologies that I keep making those promises and just not really doing, doing what I promise. Uh, but, you know, I'm doing my best. Uh, I probably will be wearing glasses for this because I cannot read the text for some of the comments there. But anyway, so, oh, the, okay, so it's the House of Castriotti. I don't know what that is, but it sounds awesome. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, if you do have uh, any questions, hopefully scientific questions, I'll try to answer as much as I can. If you have any personal questions, I cannot promise that I'll answer all of them, but I'll, I'll do my best. Um, and also, just one request, please no politics, none of the election stuff, uh, none of the religious stuff, hopefully. Um, I just, I don't want to kick people out. It's It's not... It's not what we're here for. We're just here to enjoy the eclipse. Um, and we'll be, we'll be watching this with, there are several streams going on right now. There are actually several observatories that are going to be um, essentially uh, streaming this. And we'll see whatever is best. Um, I think NASA is probably going to be the best, but we'll see if there's anything better. Um, there's also, I believe, what's the other observatory called? If you actually don't wanna watch the stream and if you want to just go ahead and, um, watch the original stream. NASA is obviously one, and there's also one by, let me, let me find the name of the observatory. I think it's McDonald Observatory, uh, but I'm not 100% certain. I'm not 100% certain. I have it somewhere here, saved. Uh, oh, uh oh, that's not it. That's something else. I was gonna comment on this too, but later. Um, oh, okay, so it's not here. I didn't save the name of the observatory. That's not cool. Where, where did it go? My apologies. I'm so uh, disorganized when it comes to live streaming. That's why I always make videos. It's so much easier. You make a mistake and you just edit it out. Uh, with a uh, live stream though, it's not, not really the same. Anyway, so let's just go. I'll, 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 mention, it, uh, I'll mention the observatory when, when the time comes. I'm sure I have it saved somewhere. Um, all right, Mohamed Elit, thank you so much for the donation. I've educated you so much. No, thank you. Um, you guys are awesome. Uh, all right, so, uh, well, there's so many comments. I'm gonna try to see, I'm gonna look for the question marks first. Uh, and if there are no question marks, I'm gonna look for anything that looks like a question. Okay, so I'm curious about the kite experiment. This is from Frederic Jozon. Uh, how does this work? Is it with a cable? To be honest, I don't know much about it. I've only read the presentation that they had um, online. 
And from what I understand, they are going to be making a relatively, I guess it is a cable, a relatively robust cable that's going to be able to support a kite with all of the instruments approximately four kilometers up in altitude, or what is this, like 12,000 something feet, 13,000 feet. Um, and that, that's pretty insane. Like that's that's really high up. And they're, they're essentially going to be flying it up in the... Uh, above the clouds, hopefully, in order to capture the totality, but also to basically capture as much um, information, as much data on the on the actual corona of the sun, which you can sort of see. Let me see if I have an image of this uh, here somewhere. Yeah, there we go. Uh, is this visible? Can you see the corona? Oh, you can see me too, though. I got to remove myself. Here we go. Uh, or also, I should probably remove this. This stream has started. So y you can see that uh, the corona right here, and that's the part that um, you know. It, 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 there's a lot of studies on this because there's there's so many mysteries about this, and the reason scientists are actually curious to study the corona the most is really because it. Oh, that's the part that affects uh, planet Earth the most. Uh, that that's the part that creates a lot of the coronal mass ejections, and that's the stuff that causes all the blackouts. And so a lot of studies today are focusing on this mostly, uh, and their study is no different. However, from what I've read is that they, they went to like three different locations, or two locations at least, to try to observe the eclipse in the past, and every single time it was cloudy, every single time. So that's their solution, make a kite, you know? I think it's a pretty good solution. All right, moving on. Uh, so what else do we have? Uh, thank you so much, the Norwegian, why does it not show me the full name? Hold on, I need to change this. Oh, I cannot see the full name. Well, how do I see your full name? The Norwegian blank. Thank you so much. Uh, greetings from Norway. Greetings from South Korea. As many of you know, uh, I'm in South Korea right now, and I've been here for a while. Uh, probably will be staying here for a little bit longer, but not forever. And uh, at some point, we'll go back to Canada. And yes, I am from Canada. A lot of you mentioned I'm from Quebec. I'm from Montreal. Um, and was raised there. Not born there, though, but raised uh, most of my life and spent quite a lot of time here in South Korea afterwards. Thank you so much, John Taylor. No, you are amazing. You are amazing, John Taylor. And oh, there's another, another Norwegian comment. Uh, Norwegian Stig says, welcome to, oh, wait, sorry. No, that says, welcome to Planetary. That's the membership. Never mind. Huh, professional, very professional. Uh, thank you so much, Power Dude, for the five subscriptions. Uh, I don't actually know how these work. I guess they're automatic. I'm not, really not sure. I'm really sorry. I haven't been streaming for, for a long while. Anyway, so here we go. Um, why is this eclipse so special? Uh, this is from Juju the Homs. Uh, one of the reasons is, I think, because it is the last eclipse in North America for the next 20 something years, 20, 21 years, I think. Uh, you're not going to be having any more total solar eclipse or even partial solar eclipses in North America for essentially until 2045, I think. Uh, so it's the last time to see them. There, this one is no part, there's nothing special about this one, but because, you know, most of these studies on, on solar stuff, on, on the sun stuff, are usually in the U.S. or in certain parts of Europe, um, because so many scientists are localized in the U.S., they're going to be super excited to see what's going on with the sun, how things change. Um, and as you might have seen from the previous video from a few days ago, one of the biggest studies I'm personally super curious about is how do animals react to all of this? What, what are animals going to be doing a lot of animals react totally differently. Some of them freak out. They have a lot of anxiety. Uh, this is especially true of the smarter, I guess, the more intelligent animals like the chimps. Other animals uh, like uh, parrots, for example, tend to have a completely different reaction depending on the species. Some of them start to do their uh, nightly routine. They get ready to sleep. Some of them also freak out and have anxiety. Um, other ones just don't care. Uh, and so, yeah, I'm actually kind of curious to, to see how other life reacts. Um, I love this video, thumbnail, and when you smile. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Dory Me, and thank you for the donation. Yeah, here's another smile. <laughs> that one's a, a little bit fake. I can do better. I'll do better when I, uh, when I get a little bit more comfortable. Uh, so someone's asking me if I speak Korean. I, I speak enough Korean um, to, to communicate in a, you know, in a regular environment, but just not good enough to, to, to do much. I, I kind of gave up a long time ago to learn Korean, mostly because, first of all, no time. Uh, second of all, uh, no time. And third of all, it, it's really hard. So unless you have a really direct connection to something in the culture, like, for example, you enjoy, uh, I don't know, like, 
anime in, J in Japanese culture or maybe you enjoy uh, Bollywood in, in Indian culture. With Korean culture, I'm not a big fan of K-pop and I'm also not a big fan of K-drama, so it's difficult for me to kind of get interested. Uh, my wife speaks Korean for me, so that's good enough. Uh, my wife is Korean, as some of you know. All right, cool. Let's move on, move on with the other questions. Um, yeah, someone is mentioning the, the tortoises really cracked them up from the video. This is Mathy. Uh, so in the video, that I, I also mentioned that apparently for some unknown reason that nobody knows why, um, during the solar eclipse, uh, tortoises, especially the giant ones like from Galapagos, they actually kind of start making love and then they stop right at the end of the eclipse. And literally no one has idea, any idea why. It's just, just a thing, just one of those myst mysteries of life. Um, maybe one day we'll figure it out. What about dogs? So dogs, uh, most breeds don't seem to care because dogs, as you probably know, uh, are not visual. They're, you know, they're, they usually mostly go with the smell. And the only thing we know about eclipses that dogs do notice is if they're outside, they'll feel the changes in the atmospheric uh, pressure and the wind, and they'll start reacting to that. Uh, so one of the things that you, if you are like, so if you are going to be witnessing to these eclipses, in, especially if you are in the central line, that's going to be right in the middle. Um, you're, apart from the visual uh, things, apart from the actual eclipse itself, you're also going to be noticing um, a lot of pressure changes and temperature changes. And all, uh, there's going to be all kinds of different changes in the wind conditions. The wind is supposed to actually completely stop. Uh, let me show you one of the images I was going to show you, actually, which is somewhere right here. Uh, no, right here. This is from... NWS Columbia of Columbia University, I believe. Uh, let me see if you can see it. Can you see this? Can you see this? Ooh, okay. My face needs to go away for a second. Uh, so this is what happens. This is what happened during the eclipse in 2017. You can see the clouds disappearing, kind of, and then they reappear um, after about an hour. They they reappear, um, and th this is something that happens just with the t uh, temperature changes and the conditions around the um, central line of the eclipse. Now, but in, in general though, um, more, all animals will react completely differently. So I'm super fascinated to find out what's going on with the animals and what they're gonna be doing. Uh, this, the study itself, there are actually three separate studies I mentioned in the video, and they're going to do uh, a kind of a follow-up this year. Um, so by the end of the year, we should have some answers, hopefully something cool. We might, we might, find, we might find out some, something interesting about different species. Okay, so uh, I'm. Oh, I missed so much. What did I miss? What did I miss? What did I miss? Uh, Todd T, thank you so much for the donation and uh, thanks, Anton. I really enjoy your content and appreciate the live stream today. You're welcome. No, thank you. Uh, all right. So, did I miss anything else here? Did not miss anything else yet. Um, how do my children react to the eclipse? Uh, my, uh, so my, my son is still a little bit too young for this. He, he knows I'm working, but he's uh, not particularly interested in it yet. He, he knows the moon, but he's only four and a half, uh, so he's not really into the eclipses yet. But he's super curious about stuff. Um, yeah, the food, uh, someone's mentioned food in Korea. Food is good. Food is great. Uh, not all food, though. Western food here is very not great, but uh, mo most of the Korean food is pretty good. But that's true of a lot of East Asian countries. Also, someone has asked me if I've ever been to Singapore. I've been to Singapore a few times, but I mostly go there for travel, really, just, just to have fun. Um, not, not, much, not, not much else there. Not, not that I don't like Singapore. I love Singapore, but I, I'm really bad with hot weather and especially humidity. I just can't handle it. So Singapore, I can stay there for maybe three days max, and then I just have to get out. Uh, North or South Korea, someone's mentioning. Uh, I wish I wish it was just one Korea at, at, the, at some point, but yeah, it's South Korea, obviously. Um, also, if you if you can't hear me very well, um, please let me know because I, I try to set this up so that I'm basically audible, but I don't really know. Okay, cool. So, um, what else did I miss? Oh, one thing I was gonna mention. So apart from this. Uh, let me let me get rid of the face again. Uh, apart from this, there's also this other thing, uh, which is from the same study. Uh, it shows you how the temperatures dramatically drop during the eclipse and how they basically go through these fluctuations. And so there's there are a lot of unusual atmospheric 
things that happen during the eclipse. And what's, um, what the scientists want to figure out is what they actually are, because a lot of them are still completely unknown. Like there's, there's one phenomenon that I was, I'm going to show you next that um, only happens sometimes, doesn't seem to happen all the time. And even now, nobody has any idea what it is. It's just a mystery. And the phenomenon, which you're going to be... Okay, so I'm going to use someone else's video. I'm going to link it in the, uh, in the description as well. This is not my video. This is someone from, I think it was an eclipse in... Um, let me see if I can do this. Hold on. It was an eclipse from Australia from like 20, 2012, maybe? Um, let's see if I can do this. Uh, oh, no. Sorry, my bad. Here we go. Wrong, wrong button. All right. So uh, this is an eclipse from Michael Zeiler from uh, somewhere in, in Australia. Um, and this is November 14, 2012. And he was able to record this super cool phenomenon that's really hard to catch. It's sort of hard to see it, but it's the, it's the unusual, like, ripply things you see on his car. Weird-looking ripply things that kind of look like shadows, but they're not really shadows. Um, and they're known, they're known as shadow bands. Uh, I mean, there's really no name for them. They're just known as shadow bands. They, it happens right before and right after the totality. Um, and th this is something that we don't know if it's going to happen this time. Uh, let me link the, I'm going to link this in the, in the chat, but also it's going to be in a video description for those of you watching later. Uh, so, so, so this is one of those phenomena that nobody can explain. Uh, nobody at NASA or uh, anywhere. And so one of those mysteries that kind of still boggles the scientists, they, they, have, they try to explain it, they try to connect it to various atmospheric effects, but it just looks like unusual ripples right before and right after. And the thing is, we, uh, historically, we've, we've known about this for a long time. It, it was even first mentioned by some of the earliest, I think, Icelandic um, explorers. They saw an eclipse in Iceland, and the kids were so excited by it, they started chasing the shadows. Uh, and so it was actually known back then. They thought it was like gods, obviously, and stuff. Um, but uh, today, we still have no idea. Probably not gods. Probably something else. Cool. Moving on. Uh, mm, someone is asking me where I studied. Uh, I studied in Montreal. I'm from Montreal, so I grew, grew up there uh, and went to all my schools there. A, okay, I'm in a near 100% totality area. So this, this is from DPT Win. Uh, should I go into a field? Where do you recommend I go? I have some trees around my house, but I can get to a Bigfoot area easily. So one thing that I actually would recommend is if you are by the trees, let me show you what you can maybe see. If you stand next to trees, because of the shadow coming from the totality and because of the shadow coming from... I guess the leftover sun rays, um, you might be able to see something super cool. And it's actually known also as, okay, I need to remove myself again uh, for a second. Video capture, remove. Here, this is, for, this is an image from NASA. Uh, it's kind of hard to see what this shows you, but these are like little ripple, like once again, ripple like shadows. And they're basically, um, oh, oh, what, what is the name? Let me just look up what, what it's called. It's called a pinhole effect. It's called a pinhole effect. And it's something that actually moves with the, with the trees, with the sun. Um, it looks, apparently, it looks absolutely incredible. Um, it, if you go on YouTube and you type pinhole effect, solar eclipse, a bunch of videos will show up because people will usually see them everywhere. And this is something you can usually see around large objects like trees. So I would first witness that. And if that's not cool, then just maybe feel it. But in the field, you're not going to see anything differently from, from the next to a tree. Uh, so, so yeah, my, my option would be next to some kind of an object that, that ca casts shadows and then look at the shadows right during the eclipse and right before it. That, that should probably show you the best perspective. My honest opinion. Uh, I've only seen this once and uh, it, it was pretty cool. I, back then I had no idea what I'm looking at and I still have no idea what I'm looking at, but it's a pinhole effect according to NASA. Um, cool. Have you ever figured it's all programmation movement of... Okay, I don't know what that means, sorry. Programmation, movement of planets, alignment, elevated blood, mood, speed of stars. I'm sorry, I'm not sure what you mean, but uh, yeah, obviously we, we know, we understand orbital dynamics pretty well, so it's no longer a mystery to us. Um, speaking of orbital, orbital dynamics and histories, 
I have a history lesson. Here, let me, let me try to read this. Did you know that apparently uh, one of the first eclipses that was officially predicted by Western society was actually obviously ancient Greece? But it was a funny story. Yeah. It, was, um, it was a Greek uh, by the name of, what's his name? Let me see, I wrote it down somewhere. His name was uh, Thales or Tales. No, it's Thales, I think. And so Thales was, at first he was a, not particularly well known, but he apparently traveled a lot. Um, he traveled enough to, to go to different locations, including, including locations where ancient Babylonia was. And back then, Babylonians were known to, to have come up with a system that kind of is able to predict um, certain eclipses. They weren't really good at it, but they cared about eclipses because they were totally freaked out by them. They were, it was the scariest thing in, in their whole existence. An eclipse for them was like, okay, time to quit. Um, and, and for Greeks, for Greeks as well, it was not, it was not actually particularly pleasant. Uh, they, they believed it was some kind of a, a combat of the gods. And so back then, uh, Thales, um, he was able to somehow find a way to predict the eclipse of 585 BC, uh, right before some kind of an important battle between the kingdom of Medes and the Lydian ki kingdoms. And because he was able to predict it and inform those kings, they not only did, did not only did they stop the battle, they actually signed a, an alliance and they like had kids intermarry because they thought it was such a humongous thing that happened to them that they basically believed that he predicted something really important. But he actually worked this out by using a lot of mathematics, a lot of different devices, including the ancient um, device that we know existed back then called Antikythera, Antikythera mechanism. There's an older video on the channel that talks about this a little bit. Um, it's it kind of looks like this. We, we, we actually, not we, but uh, sci scientists, archaeologists, they've discovered a lot of these, um, mostly in, Medi in the Mediterranean, in the oceans. And they were devices that are still not entirely well, under well understood, but for the most part, it's believed that they were able to predict a lot of solar events and lunar events, and not very accurately, but good enough. And so he was able to somehow work it out and predict it to the actual like minute, basically. Not, okay, maybe not minute, but probably to the actual hour because he was able to announce it before the battle started. And that was cool. And so Thales was officially the first, I guess, Western um, astronomer, technically, uh, who predicted something in regards to eclipses. And since then, he became a celebrity, kind of like, uh, like Einstein in 1919. If it wasn't for the eclipse of 1919, nobody would even know Einstein. Uh, he, was only, uh, he, was only, he only became famous because of that. Um, cool story. Next, moving on. Uh, all right. Okay, people are saying I'm not making enough jokes. Well, I'm sorry, okay? It's like 12 a.m. in the morning. I'm, I'm not a joke person at night. I'll try my best, okay? Um, okay, have you... Okay, I've read this. Okay, 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 okay. Someone is asking me about black holes merging with white holes. Um, it, I mean, when, when an object merges with a, with a black hole, usually it, it, it will result in the same, uh, same phenomenon. They'll usually experience a tremendous release of energy. Uh, most of the um, energy will be converted, or most of the matter will be converted into energy, and some of it is going to fall into the black hole, but most of it is just released as an explosion. Okay, uh, moving on. Thank you so much, Mary LeBlanc, for the donation. Thank you so much. And also, Mike Bundy. Oh, here we go. Question. Do total eclipses occur near sunrise or sunset, or is it an orbital dynamics impossibility? That's actually a good question. Sunrises or sunsets? Um, I, th I mean, I, I don't see why not. They should be able to. So, oh, here. I, I was going to show you this. Um, I have Space Engine set up for funsies, um, and... You can actually see, wait, where is it? Where, where is my thing? You can actually see that if you were to kind of, this is in real time in Space Engine, so this is basically minute to minute. You can actually see the shadow is gonna start appearing somewhere right here, and it's going to be pretty early on. Um, but, okay, so sunrise. I, uh, yeah, sunrise is gonna be almost impossible though. Yeah, no, it's, it's gonna be almost impossible. It has to be, it has to be a little bit higher in, in, the, in the skies. It, from certain locations, you can see a partial eclipse during sunrise, I think, but it will be almost impossible. Um, 
So yeah, no, it's it has to be like somewhere near noon, basically. And so it's going to start so in, in North America, it's going to start somewhere right here. There are parts of Mexico that are going to get an amazing, amazing experience. Um, also parts of California. And it's just going to travel this way and it's going to go that way, I think. Um, but we're going to be seeing this in real time soon. Uh, I think it's supposed to start like in two hours ish, maybe less than that. Um, okay. Where's my, where's my stream? Here we go. Cool. 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 Uh, okay. Moving on. My voice sounds better. Life. Oh, thank you. Actually. Um, so one present I got from my son is, uh, a bit of a illness, and so I have a sore throat right now. So that's probably why. Whenever I'm coarse, I kind of sound better. Whenever my voice gets really coarse. Um, okay. Uh, okay. Oh yeah. So okay. So someone mentioned there was a study on bacteria during the eclipse. Um, yeah, I have this open somewhere too. I was gonna mention that too. So this is a really strange topic actually, because um, there there is a study, I think it was from India, where they, for some reason, they decided to put bacteria in the Petri dish during the eclipse. And then they, I guess they exposed them to the sunlight and uh, moonlight. Um, and according to them, they, they grew differently during, specifically during the totality. And there was no explanation for it. They think it's because of some kind of um, maybe possibly predation of other bacteria or possibly some kind of interaction. But that study was from 10 years ago. And I don't know if it was ever recreated because I don't think anyone ever considered or even proposed of what's happening with that particular situation. Um, let me see if I have it here. I think I have it open somewhere. Is that it? Oh, yeah, that's it. So here we go. Uh, oh, yeah effect of solar eclipse on microbes. Uh, and so this was from, oh yeah, uh, so 15th of January, 20, 2010. And they've used a bunch of bacteria. They put them in a Petri dish, they observed them. And apparently, uh, according to them, they changed in, oh, they changed in shape and they also grew differently. And that will happen in like those three, four hours, which I guess kind of makes sense, but nobody knows why. And if that's true, then cool. If not true, then I'm sure there, there might have been something else that they did. I mean, if you take the bacteria out, so if you take the bacteria into a different environment, they will probably do something differently. So there could have been some um, additional effects. But it's a it's an interesting it's an interesting study. Let me actually, if you want to read it, I'll post it in the comments as well. It will be um, it will be also in the uh, video description for later. Okay, back to questions. Am I going to stream until the eclipse end? I'm gonna try to. Um, we'll see how it goes. I, I mean, with NASA streams and just streams of eclipses in general, you never know what's gonna happen. Uh, they, you know, if it's cloudy, then there's probably going, not going to be much point. Um, if it's cool, if it's interesting, and if NASA has a lot to say, then we'll we'll just co we'll we'll comment on their comments, and we'll talk about that. But hopefully, yeah, hopefully I'll I'll be able to survive until the end of the eclipse. I have my extra large coffee here. Almost finished. Uh, this is the advantage of living in South Korea. You get massive coffees. Um, okay. Oh, thank you so much, Robbie, for the donation. Uh, will Eclipse set off earthquakes? So, um, it, 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 this is a tough question. It goes, it goes with that video I made about predicting earthquakes. So technically the actual, you know, the actual phenomenon of alignment of planets and, and, um, the sun itself is definitely going to increase the amount of tidal effects on the planet Earth. So in theory, it should do something, but because earthquakes are so ridiculously complex and because it's so extremely difficult to predict those events, we don't know. It might just shift something. It might change some positioning of uh, certain plates. Um, it might cause an earthquake or it might not. It might have already caused an earthquake. There was an earthquake earlier somewhere in the world. Uh, I read about an earthquake, I think, in, in the US. Uh, so it could have been because of that, but you know, tidal effects are, and especially when it comes to earthquakes, it's just so complicated. There's almost no way to predict them accurately. Uh, it, scientists have tried for decades. They still can't figure it out. No matter what you hear online, it's almost impossible to predict an earthquake. We can anticipate them based on the location, just not, not based on like actual time and place. 
Uh, okay, someone in, from Ohio is saying that it's going to be very sunny there. So I guess if you're in Ohio, go outside in about two hours. You'll probably see it. That's awesome. Kind of jealous a little bit. Um, next question. Also, maybe comment going through these one by one. Uh, yeah, someone's mentioned there's like a hundred different uh, streams right now. So I'm not going to be sad if you leave. It's okay. Um, there, I'm sure there, there are some streams that are going to have some really cool comments and a lot of jokes, which I'm not making so far. So yeah, that, that's true. Cool. So, okay. Uh, here we go. Uh, okay, someone is asking me about magic mushrooms. I don't know much about that. I'm sorry. Also, I'm not allowed to talk about this in South Korea. This, this country is very, very no-no when it comes to drugs. Sorry, can't answer. I'm going to keep my mouth shut. Um, does the solar eclipse dr drastically affect the sun facing side of the moon during the eclipse? Hold on, I have to reread this. Does the solar eclipse drastically affect the sun facing side of the moon? Oh, no. I don't think so. Why would it? No, the moon doesn't feel anything different. Um, okay, tidally. Tidally, maybe. Uh, yeah, yes. Okay, so in terms of tidal effects, because the moon is like basically now stretched by both planet Earth and the sun, there is maybe something going on on the side of the moon as well. But in terms of the actual effects, no, it, it still gets the same. Um, as far as I know. Um, okay, cool. Cool, cool, cool. Cool, cool, cool. Okay, someone said if I make a joke, they're leaving. Okay, that's cool. I don't think I'll be making jokes. I, I'm super tired when it comes to midnight and past, and it's already past midnight, so no jokes coming, probably. Um, how far east will the eclipse be visible? I think, um, let, me, let me go back to the space engine. From what I remember, look, oh wait, no, I have a map. What am I talking about? I have a map. I can prepare it, kind of. Is that the map? Yeah, here's the map. You can see it right here. This is by NASA and specifically by a person by the name of Fred Espenak. He actually made this over 22 years ago. So he was able to predict the eclipse all the way back there, back then. Uh, so it starts kind of here-ish goes through, uh, I guess, parts of Mexico, a little bit of, oh yeah, like California is not getting as much, I guess. And then it goes through all of this and ends in um, somewhere in Nova Scotia, I guess. And we'll probably go, oh wait, that's there's an island here somewhere, isn't there? So yeah, it's going to add somewhere here, but I think this part is not as impressive. This is going to be the, the best part to see. And if you look at this map, which I'm going to post in the comments as well, and also in the video description, um, you can, oh, did it work? Yeah. Uh, you can actually see the next one, and the next one is 2026, but it's in a location not a lot of us, not a lot of us are going to be able to attend. Um, I, I think it's actually going to have some in Europe, but for the most part, it's basically just like um, a little bit of Iceland and a lot of Greenland, but very remote locations. Oh, also here. I guess, parts of northern Russia, but don't think anyone is going to be able to attend that either. Uh, and you can actually go through the map and see what, which one is next for you. If, you want to, if you're missing this one, like me, I'm going to be missing this one. You can go and see uh, what else is uh, going to be cool for you. So that is the map. Next, comment, question, and concern. Let's see, where's my stream? Uh, here we go. Okay. Uh, someone's asking me, why am I in South Korea and not in Montreal? It was mostly because of jobs. Uh, I, when I graduated, it was literally the depression era, uh, 2007, 2000, 2006, 2007, 2008. There was no jobs and they had jobs here in East Asia. So I came here and I basically kind of stayed. Um, I, I worked here as a uh, math, computer science and science teacher for a pretty long time. And then I just decided to do YouTube at least for now, we'll see where it goes. But yeah, no, South Korea is good. If you can figure out how to live here, it can be pretty stressful. Uh, this is a very, very uh, demanding culture. There's a lot, if you work for a Korean company, it's very, very challenging. Luckily, I was working for an American uh, school. 
so someone's asking me about animal studies on the eclipse. Yeah, I mentioned that just now, but yeah, there are going to be a lot of studies. You can also watch the video from three days ago that goes through that. Um, cool, 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 cool. Um, so someone from Quebec City is saying they're just outside the zone of total eclipse, so they're going to bail work and drive an hour to see it. I will not tell your boss. I will do, I would actually do the same. And funny story, I have done that as well in South Korea. When I just came here, it was like 2008, I think, there was a partial eclipse. So I might have possibly ditched my uh, work for a few hours to, to go on the roof and to look, look at the eclipse. Uh, fun story, back then I didn't actually know you're not supposed to look at it through a CD. Somewhere online I looked up, they, they, had a, they had a cheap solution to look at the eclipse through the actual CD, blank CD. Um, don't do that. It's not good for you. Do not use CDs. They don't want to protect your eyes. Um, what are the odds that Earth's orbit is perfect distance from the sun and the moon is precisely the right size and distance in between to perform a total eclipse? This is by Adam and Hume. That odd, the odds for that are, I mean, the actual question is, what are the odds that we're here during that time? That, that is, that, that's the actual question. And the odds there are astronomically low. It's extremely, extremely rare for, uh, for, for, a uh, sorry, for the moon to be exactly the same size as the star itself in the night skies or in the skies uh, in general um, to match sizes just like sun and the moon do. So the sun is 400 times as far, but 400 times as large as the moon, but they appear the same size. And that by itself is super rare. We're just here to know it, to witness it. And, but I mean, it's not just us. I mean, the dinosaurs had it too. And we're, this will actually still be around for at least 500, 600 million years. So not, the solar eclipses are not disappearing anytime soon. The moon is moving away, but it's moving away really slowly, like something like an inch per year. How did you get to South Korea? I took an airplane. Ha, huh? my first joke of the night. Please don't leave. Um, so yeah, uh, next comment, question and concern is in regards to someone who, oh, the house of Castriotti is asking me if I ever thought about contacting NASA or Elon Musk for a six figure job. That's a funny question. Um, you would be surprised. You would be super surprised how uh, not interested they are to talking to someone like me or just someone without specific experience they're looking for. NASA, NASA, wouldn't, um, NASA doesn't even allow non-Americans to attend certain events, uh, I guess because of um, security issues. But even as a Canadian, I was not allowed to attend certain um, events to, uh, like, we're talking about events related to announcements or related to new discoveries. Uh, they will not allow you in the room, basically. You have to be American. Uh, whereas Elon Musk is Elon Musk. He has his own thing going. I'm sure he, he knows who he wants. It's probably not me. Uh, I'm, I'm too slow and a little bit lazy when it comes to work. I don't think he's going to like my ethics. Greens from Australia. Hello, Greens from South Korea to you too, Dynaman Space. How do you organize a solar eclipse party? You plan it. Tum -tum so this is not mine, I swear. This is from Zipora Shoshana. Um, okay, cool. Cool story. Moving on. Um, so... Will, okay, so this is actually a really important question. Will you be able to see anything cool in rainy or cloudy weather? So th this in rainy, probably not. But in cloudy weather, the clouds technically, as I showed you previously, let me show you again, uh, it, it, they might disappear. They, they might disappear and you might actually see it uh, here. Uh, here we go. They might, so this was during the 2017 eclipse. They might completely disappear and like just for like an hour, there's going to be no clouds at all. And this is because of the way that the clouds form. Um, it's, a, it's a type of a heat exchange. So as the earth warms up, the air travels up and uh, the, all of the water particles start forming clouds. But during the eclipse, the, the temperature kind of equalizes. And so the, uh, the clouds no longer uh, form. And this basically ends everything for the cloud formation, but will open up the eclipse technically. Now, if this is going to happen in practice, I have no idea. I've never witnessed anything like this. However, 
it would be cool to find out because I, I don't know enough about atmospheric science. And I think there's actually, there are still a lot of questions that are completely unanswered when it comes to eclipses and atmospheric science. And so I have no idea, to be honest. I would love to find out though. For, uh, I, would like, I would like to find some kind of a study that explains this. Okay. <laughs> Will this event be visible from Minecraft server? Um, from, uh, as far as I know, wait, does Minecraft even have moons? I don't remember, I haven't played it in so long. I would say no. You're gonna have to log off. Um, okay. Hello to you too from, uh, so someone from Brazil, Dolcium, is saying hello. Hello to you too. Okay, next, 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 next. Uh, what do we have here? Okay. So if, yeah, just, just a small comment here. If you want me to try to answer your question, try, I, uh, maybe tag my name or something. I, sometimes it's really hard to see um, comments, especially because the font here is really small. That's why I'm wearing glasses. So yeah, I'm gonna try my best. Uh, okay, 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 okay. Okay, I think I answered all the questions, maybe possibly. Let me actually go through something else I was gonna mention. Um, something else I was gonna mention is, oh, so during the eclipse, if you are actually watching this at some point, okay, so if you are watching it, uh, you probably wanna leave house now. Yeah, you might miss it. Um, so it's like an hour or something left, depending on how far you are. But so, so one thing you might notice, um, there, there are maybe three things I would look out for if you can see it, and hopefully NASA will mention it during the stream. So the first thing is something I mentioned in the video before is visible in this video. I mean, this picture, and it's right here. This is something you can only see for like a few seconds during, uh, right before and maybe right after the eclipse. And these are, these are called the um, ba Bailey's beads. Bailey, not, not like the alcohol drink, but just different guy's name. Uh, and there, there is, there are literally tiny, tiny uh, deformations on the surface of the moon, like mountains and cracks and stuff through which the light actually goes through. And so in theory, you could use the light source here to even kind of calculate what the moon's surface looks like. But this was originally uh, explained like 200 something years ago by, I think his name was, was it Thomas Bailey? I just made a video, I forgot his name already. Um, and he was able to explain this exactly precisely. And so it's named after him. Um, and so Bailey's beads are super cool, apparently. I've never seen them myself, I always miss them. Um, but if you can, catch the eclipse totality specifically, like a few seconds right before the, the totality, then you might be able to see it. However, if you miss this, the next thing you're going to be seeing is going to be this. And that's of course the um, different, uh, uh, what are they called now? Uh, oh man, how can I forget the name? They are called, uh, my apologies. I'm, I totally forgot the name for this. Anyway, they're basically the coronal ejections. Uh, so the, they look, uh, they, they, they kind of dance around the sun and they, they sort of protrude from the sun. Um, I'm sure someone in the comments already mentioned and I'm being, I'm playing a, a game of catch up here. Uh, here we go. Oh, come on, what is this called? Ah, uh, I know it, it's almost there. They're not solar flares, no. They're cold, where is it? <laughs> this is funny. Uh, okay, here we go. I'm gonna read it. It's a prominence. Ah, uh, so dumb. So dumb, Anton. Didn't prepare. Uh, all right. So prominence. Uh, prominence is basically like the protrusions from from the uh, uh, solar surface, um, and they're part of the corona, and you you can see them very very well right at the totality for like maybe thirty seconds ish, and then they disappear as soon as the beads appear. The the prominence disappears. So apparently that's the coolest part. Um, I've never seen the, this part either. I've unfortunately never seen the total eclipse, so I missed this as well. Um, but yeah, if you can see this, that's basically it. You can kind of call it uh, quits. That's all you have to see. Um, however, if you can catch that other, other phenomenon I mentioned, uh, which is somewhere right here, right? The other phenomenon, this one. Let me see, let me show this to you again. The shadow bands, now that's, that's like super rare. That's, well, this is actually the rarest event you can witness during the total eclipse. 
And what, as I mentioned, this is still super mysterious. Absolutely no one, no one knows what it is. Probably something to do with the atmosphere, but there's currently no definitive answer. So that is one other thing you can see. Um, and what else do we have here? Is there anything else uh, I'm missing? I think, I think I got everything. Pinhole effect, I've talked about that. Uh, there's gonna be winds, temperature change, solar prominence, Bailey beads. Um, oh, if you have a radio emitter, uh, sorry, if you, just, if you have a radio of some sort, apparently there are going to be different types of radio interference. Um, and that's because during the eclipse, um, the, the temperature, the atmospheric temperature changes will actually uh, change the ionosphere as well. And so the ionosphere right above the location is going to drop so much that the propagation of radio waves is going to be entirely different. So it might affect radio transmissions, but you might not notice it actually. It's very hard to notice. But if you do have some kind of a um, satellite, you will definitely notice it. So those are the things to watch out for if you're actually observing this. Um, and uh, yeah, okay, I covered this part. Cool. Okay, so next, let's see if there's any other questions I missed. Um, thank you so much, Lila Rivera. You're my number one fan, oh my God. Thank you. Well, honestly, it's probably, it's probably my son though. <laughs> no offense. My son loves my videos. I don't know why, he just likes watching me. Um, cool, so moving on. Uh, What did I miss? I missed a bunch of questions, didn't I? Can you see a, co oh, oh yes. Thank you for reminding me Juan Pedro Mariano. You should be able to see possibly maybe the comet. There's a comet in the skies. And you might, if you get super lucky, you might see it. I don't know if NASA is going to be able to find it. Uh, NASA telescope should be able to see it, but there is a comet and who, it's, it's a comet that's out right now, technically. Uh, it's called 12P Pons Brooks. Do I have the, let me see if I can find it. Uh, comet 12P Pons Brooks. Um, that comet is going to be around for a few more weeks, but it should be visible. You might be able to see it if you are in the right location where there's just the right amount of um, darkness. So comet, you might see the stars. Obviously, you'll see the stars. You might see two planets, Venus and Jupiter. And you should be able to see, um, well, well, that's about it, I guess. The stars, the stars, the planets, and the comet. And the other things I mentioned. OK, cool. So yeah, that's one comet that maybe look out for. If you're, if you're watching this, I, I'm definitely going to be missing this because unless NASA showed, it, showed this to us. Um, I tried to find this comet a, a few days ago, but um, most of the locations in East Asia just don't have enough uh, darkness. The light pollution here is really bad, so you're not going to be able... Uh, most of us cannot actually do astronomy anymore. It's too hard. So I'm, I'm relying on people's studies and papers to do this for, for fun. Uh, okay. Hello from Indonesia. Hello to you, to NFL Storm Chasing. Um... Okay, so oh, okay, so Australia had an eclipse last year. I I actually did not know that. I must have missed it. Thank you so much, Avon um, Neve, for telling me. Um, will the Earth's orbit change during the transit behind the Moon, as it will be in the shadow of the Moon and intercepting the Sun's direct gravity? No, no, it's not going to change. I mean, obviously there are tidal effects that are going to shift things a little bit, but it's not. The orbit is pretty stable. Did I welcome wonderful persons? I did. I thought. And if not, hello, wonderful person, um, people. And uh, hello to you, all of you, and stay wonderful. Um, and moving on. What about the fauna during the eclipse? So, like trees, I guess? Um, I'm not sure if this is going to change anything. For trees, like I mentioned before, you might, if you, if you are next to a tree, you should be able to see this. Um, which are the, um, the really cool effects caused by the shadow. But um, other than that, I don't think you'll be able to see, um, I don't think you'll be able to see anything. 
uh, when it comes to trees. I mean, anything special that is. Uh, there's really nothing special I can think of. Um, okay, so someone, uh, Christopher Person is asking me theories about why the sun's corona is so much hotter in detail. Wh a lot of studies that are going to be um, going on right now during the eclipse are trying to answer these questions. And even now, there is really kind of no direct answer for why the solar corona, which is, of course, this part, so much can I zoom in? No, I, should, I can't. Um, so much hotter than the, um, the rest of the sun. So the sun is like about just over five thousand uh, degrees Celsius, whereas um, whereas the uh, corona for the most part is over two million degrees Celsius, and that is a pretty big difference. Um, and um, one of the interesting things I mentioned, uh, to, I mean interesting to me, maybe not interesting to you. Um, one of the things I mentioned in one of the last videos is. Uh, when they discovered helium, which was because of the total eclipse, um, scientists started looking for more elements that they could maybe find by looking at the uh, spectroscopic um, light coming from the uh, corona. And they discovered something really unusual, and they called it coronium. They actually just called it coronium. They thought they just found discovered uh, some kind of a new element nobody knew about before. But turns out that this was actually superheated iron that was 2 million degrees hot. And they, were, they had no idea why. And back then, and even now, we're still trying to figure out. But there was maybe at least one study that tried to explain this as these weird vortices, magnetic vortices on the surface of the sun that are like super, super small, hard to see, that might somehow kind of like join in together. And because of the magnetic interaction and sort of forcing of the plasma, they, they tend to like condense plasma into certain spots, making it super hot. But yeah, there's really no direct answer, at least as far as I know. I, I mean, I tried to look up Corona. I mean, I have a lot of Corona videos planned, but I tried to look up all of the modern studies on it. And right now there's just no exact answer. And that's why, that's why there are still so many studies that are um, usually done on total, during total, total eclipses because uh, scientists just want to find a way to answer these questions. Uh, we want to understand Corona uh, really well because it allows us to obviously predict coronal mass ejections which can then protect the technology we have on the planet. Uh, as you might have seen from some of the previous videos, uh, coronal mass ejection is one event that a lot of scientists are not sure how our technology is going to react to. So if there is a Carrington event, uh, or even, even half a Carrington event, it's going to dramatically affect us. So we want to be able to kind of at least predict it or be able to explain what's going to happen. Will the animals freak out? Uh, I don't know. We'll, we'll see. And the agent. This is a question from someone else. Um, okay. Oh, someone is giving me a kiss. Thank you. You too. Mwah -mwah. Okay. Uh, oh, thank you so much, uh, Maya Torres Artaos. Thank you for the donation. And there's a very cute emoticon. Uh, did you stay up late or did you get up early? Uh, 2010 is asking me that. And you can probably guess that I had to stay up late. It's currently 1 a.m. here. And I'm probably going to be up until 4 a.m. And uh, my whole family is sleeping right now, so I'm going to have to go home right after. I'm, I'm actually in my recording studio right now. I have a small studio that I'm renting for, for this year. And uh, it, it is super tough to, to stay up to do things like this. This is, this is actually why I don't really stream as much or at least try not to stream as much because usually when there's an event in the United States, it's super, super late here. And so I have to make sacrifices. But this was this one this one I can I can make I can make one sacrifice. My wife okayed it. Um oh, okay so Little Sparrow is presenting an interesting question. Um uh, a question about fauna. How do flowers react to solar events? And is there any research? I am not familiar with any specific research, but my guess is that just like animals that don't um don't really have a lot of sensations when it comes to uh, s different solar eclipses, they will probably do their night nightly procedures. They'll probably start closing. Now, I'm going to get back to you on that because that's something I actually want to do some research on. Uh, but we know that uh, a lot of simpler animals like bees, ants, um, animals that usually rely on foraging during daytime and shut down somewhere like a burrow during nighttime, all of them will react by, by starting their nighttime routines. 
they'll actually see the uh, darkness approaching and they'll think it's nighttime and they'll start closing their burrows. They'll start. So a lot of ants, they actually usually freak out because they think it's nighttime, time to go home. And many ants get stuck outside. Um, and, and some of them actually end up getting lost completely. So for a lot of animals, this is not fun times. And obviously for humans, it was not fun times for many, many centuries, for many thousands of years. Uh, it was the scariest time ever. Uh, as you might have heard from the previous video, um, the Chinese emperors were terrified of eclipses. And so uh, there was a time, one of the first eclipses mentioned in Chinese history is the one where the emperor was so upset that it was not predicted by his astrologists that he had them killed because they failed. And so he was too scared and he thought his rule is over. And so he had them, I think he had them quartered or something. Not a, not a nice death. Um, anyway, so the, yeah, so I, obviously animals get really scared of the eclipses. Not all, um, but many do. Uh, yeah, so someone is mentioning that NASA is firing three sounding rockets. Uh, I, I mentioned this in the video as well. Uh, the, they're going to be firing one in about 40 minutes from now. They're going to fire one during the, uh, during the eclipse, and they're going to fire another one 35 minutes after the eclipse. And their whole um, reason for that is to study the atmospheric changes and the ionosphere changes by exploring um, what exactly happens during those times uh, when, we, we, when we basically get sudden shadow um, on the planet. I mean, we kind of understand what already happens, but they want to know exact details. They're, they're firing sounding rockets, which are smaller rockets that usually just go up and come down right away. Uh, so they're not going to be staying in orbit. <clears throat> um, someone's asking me about Korean um, myths in regards to eclipses. I don't know much about the Korean mythology, to be honest. Um, it is different from Chinese mythology, but I don't think... So I think with Korea, because the country is so small and has always been so small, they didn't really get to experience eclipses as much. So I would have to look this up. I'm kind of curious now. But I don't think there's any specific mythology in regards to eclipses. So for, you know, for a, a certain location to experience eclipse um, at this, uh, twice, basically in the same spot, I think you have to wait like 375 years or something like that. It's a pretty long time. And in, Korea might have experienced one or two in the last few hundreds of years. Um, and when the, uh, so in between those eclipses, so much has changed and the, you know, the empires and the dynasties fell and uh, changed. So there's just, I don't think there's enough information about it, but I, I'll have to look it up. I'm kind of curious. Surprised I actually didn't think of this before. Um, thank you so much, Chug, for the donation. Um, I'm wondering what your personal favorite galaxy is beside the Milky Way. Favorite galaxy? Huh. Favorite galaxy. Do I have a favorite galaxy? I mean, in terms of, like, visual presentation, um, in terms of the way galaxies look, it would have to be this one, Centaurus A. That's the, the, that's the neighbor we have. Let me open it up here. Uh, can you see this? Yeah, there we go. So that's that's the galaxy a few million light years away. And it actually does not look like this in optical light, but it does look like this if you combine optical, um, radio, UV, and X-rays. And it just creates these beautiful, beautiful jets that you see going in two directions. Obviously, there's a very active black hole in the middle. But if you look at this in the optical light, it just looks like a blob. And from what, from what I think, uh, remember, you can actually even see it with a relatively modern telescope. You have to have a very powerful telescope to see it really well. So one of those galaxies that kind of present its, presents itself really, really, uh, really beautifully in different types of light. Um, but other than that, in, in terms of, um, I guess, science, I'm still fascinated by M87, you know, the black hole, that the, the picture of the black hole that the scientists took back in 2019. Uh, that one is pretty cool has a lot of stuff going on in it. I mean, one, one obvious question is, why is the black hole so massive there? It's over a thousand times more massive than the black hole in the middle of our own galaxy, and definitely quite a mysterious place. Cool, moving on. Uh, where did I stop? Here. Uh, okay. Someone is asking me if I'm Ukrainian. No, I'm not Ukrainian. 
I, I support Ukraine during the invasion, obviously, but I'd rather not talk about politics right now. And we did raise money. Uh, so as some of you know, um, in uh, 2022, r literally right after the war started, unfortunately, uh, our three months old son passed away. Um, so that was that was like the worst year for my whole family. And so during that time, just because obviously I was in shock and uh, super devastated, we decided to raise a lot of money for um, for the kids in Ukraine. And I mean, if you if you are one of the people that donated, thank you so much. We, we ended up raising like over two hundred thousand dollars and uh, part of it that came from the PayPal donations ended up in one of the orphanages here in South Korea. Uh, I posted all of this stuff uh, in some of the uh, comments, uh, not comments, what are they called? The, the, feed, the feed that you get on YouTube. So the kids uh, in Korea got some of the money and also the kids in uh, Ukraine, hopefully. I mean, I, it was through YouTube uh, donation system, so I kind of trust them, but uh, yeah, no, I, I'm sure it I'm sure went to a good, good cause. But so during, during that time, I, we were supporting Ukraine. And at this point, I'm just fed up. I don't, don't want to think about it anymore. It's, it's one of those things where it's like, yeah, OK. Sure, m maybe some of my family was from those regions, but it's, I don't want to connect myself to that. I'd rather focus on science. Um, <coughs> my apologies. Here comes my sore throat. OK, I need to take a sip of my coffee. Um, thank you so much for the donation. Pull us. <clears throat> okay, so Zephyr is asking me a question from his little brother. Important question. Okay, if the moon is out of, if the moon is out of cheese, will it turn into grilled cheese when it touches the sun? If the moon is out of cheese, will it turn into grilled cheese? I don't. Hmm. If the moon is out of cheese, will it turn into grilled cheese when it touches the sun? It's going to burn. It's going to turn into burnt cheese. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I love questions from little kids, but sometimes it's really hard to answer them. Um, cool. Cool story. Moving on. Um, our, oh, okay, this, this is an interesting question from uh, Rouge B. Roblox. Are all galaxies maintained by a black hole in the center? No, 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 not all. Um, the nearby galaxy known as, let me show you the picture, <clears throat> Triangulum Galaxy. This is the galaxy that just, for some reason, gets absolutely no attention from anyone. And it's, it's actually one of the closest in the galaxies to us. Uh, this one doesn't, ha doesn't seem to have a black hole, or at least it's not visible here. Uh, very beautiful galaxy, Triangulum Galaxy is right next to Andromeda. So it's approximately, oh, where'd it go? Come back. Where'd it go? Oh, it's being slow. OK. Uh, it's one of the closest galaxies. It's uh, approximately just over 3 million light years away. And it's one of the satellites that we have. Not a satellite, really. It's one of the neighbors of Milky Way and the Andromeda. And even though it might look like there's something in the center, it does not seem to have a central black hole. And there are plenty of, bla uh, plenty of galaxies, usually smaller ones, that don't seem to have black holes. Um, but the real sort of, I guess, explanation is that they must have had one and maybe lost it, possibly due to collisions with other galaxies, where um, it's a three-body problem that actually is a video that's coming out really soon, uh, where one of the black holes can get kicked out. And actually, even two black holes can get kicked out. And so maybe that's what happened. But not all, not all galaxies. OK, cool. Um, so, is asking, uh, so Christopher person is asking me, what is my take on Sabine's criticism on physics academia? So, I mean, Sabine is, a, a, if, you, if, you know, if you know who she is, she's the, um, I guess, academic turned YouTuber. Uh, she does have a lot of criticism on modern physics and modern academia, the way it's headed and the way it's done. I personally tend to avoid these types of, um, I guess, comment videos, uh, mentality in general. I myself did not want to stay in academia, even though I could have, uh, because it was too political. It was too negative, too almost, I would say, toxic. But that's not to say that it's not good. A lot of good things come out of academia. And I think maybe that's what happened to her. Maybe she started noticing toxicity and started to express it. Um, I have no idea, honestly. I've never really talked to her in person. Um, but everyone has opinions, and she obviously doesn't seem to like where it's headed. I think so far from what I've seen, so basically, if, if, you, ever, if you ever see my videos, um, a lot of them have archive links. And archive is the repository of papers. And 
I go through like, kind of skim through like hundreds usually uh, per week. And from what I've seen so far, I like where it's going. I don't, I don't know if there is something that maybe she knows that I don't, but so far academia has been growing and developing and maturing and uh, has been, a lot of people have been releasing amazing, incredible studies. And all of this actually started happening in the last, I would say 10 years. 10 years ago, academia was not on the same level at all. Now we are like basically reaching the golden age. Now, maybe obviously in some fields, like in physics, where specific theoretic, uh, specifically theoretical physics, maybe in those fields, it's like, uh, I don't know. Um, but for the most part, I think it's, it's actually in a good position. Oh, I think I need to turn off my, hold on. My fan is on. I need to turn off my fan using my application here. It's making sounds. All right. Um, Oh yeah, someone is reminding everyone, Daniel Gorbea is reminding everyone not to look at the sun directly with telescopic devices without lenses. That's, thank you so much. That, I should have totally message, uh, mentioned that. Um, you, honestly, just avoid looking at the sun in general, maybe until the totality itself, if you are, if you are looking at it. Um, but even then, I would still be careful. They, if, even though they do say that it's technically safe to look at th this part, uh, where, hum, hum, let me show you this. It, they do say it's safe. Um, I mean, remember, this is still like, you know, x-rays and stuff. So most of it gets captured by the atmosphere. But yeah, you're not going to like go blind, but you can damage your eyes. So be careful. Don't look at it directly. You Make sure to use pr uh, protective glasses at all times. No direct observations. Um, anyway, so yeah, Sabine, Sabine is cool. I think she's, I think she's good. But... I don't know much about the politics behind it. Moving on. Oh, someone's going to yoga class. Have a great stream. Thank you, Power Dude. I wish I could go to yoga right now. Today was my first ever attempt at uh, doing, what is it called? H-I-I-T, high intensity something something training. And I don't want to do it again. It's too much. It almost killed me. I think I'm too old. Um, OK, uh, Packer Samurai, thank you for the donation and the uh, comment. Haza Anton, we love you and your wonderful family. No, I love you more. You don't realize how much you are go-to source for everything stellar. Peace and cheers on Eclipse Day. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I'm glad that it helps you. Um, oh, oh, no. My comments just skipped. I missed the comment. Where was it? Come back. Where did it go? Okay. This is really... YouTube needs to fix the comment thing. Um, Um, did I miss the comment just now? Oh, I'm sorry. I was just reading your comment, the person that I was about to answer. Uh, 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 okay, here we go. Here we go. Oh, no, that's not it. Here we go. Could you show the difference between a black hole seen from the side and from the top or bottom, or is that currently not possible? Could you show the difference? Could you show the? Di could I show the difference? I don't have the simulations for, for that, but I mean, if you're asking me if, if there is a difference uh, the way you look at the black hole, the, all black holes are going to look slightly different because of the accretion disk. And the accretion disk, they do have a certain um, inclination. But the actual difference uh, in terms of gravitation, um, light bending effects is really the same uh, unless there's an accretion disk. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know. I think it's the same. Okay, Kelly. Thank you so much, Kelly, for the donation. I uh, wanted to say my husband has watched you for a long time, even has the shirt. Yay! I also have the shirt I'm wearing right now. Self-promotion. Uh, by the way, if, you, if I wasn't clear before, a lot of the donations that are made, like, including the t-shirts, I still do donations to the... Uh, we, we actually support one of the orphanages in South Korea. The money does go to them. Um, th this is not for... I mean, it is, it's like technically for profit, but then I take the profit and I give it to them. Uh, but yeah. Just so you know. Uh, we've just gotten our 13-year-old nephew into the channel also. Yes, thank you. I love kids. He wants to be an astrophysicist. Awesome. I'm doing my job, I hope. Um, you think that the universe is expanding or is contracting based on observations made by JWST? So Kiki is asking if the universe is expanding or contracting. There's no evidence that it's contracting. It's, there's all, all of the evidence we have is that it's not just expanding, it's accelerating. So the evidence there is just overwhelming. It's beyond, I think it's beyond the, um, what's the word? 
beyond reasoning. No, beyond beyond proof. It's the proof is there's too many too many uh, pieces of evidence. Um, could I show the differences? Oh, okay, I read that. Ha. Huh. Uh, next, a silly question. If they say the singularity of a black hole is a place where all physics break, if you have maybe theoretical sci-fi technology, could you create worlds with your own physics? This is from the skull that talks. So, so here's the thing. Singularity by itself is, is a concept that uh, most physicists don't actually accept it, first of all. They think we just don't have physics for those uh, particular situations. So singularity is more of a math concept, the concept of infinity. Um, and in that sense, um, the modern the modern physics as we have it breaks down, but there is definitely new physics going on that we just don't have yet. And most scientists today believe that it's something we refer to as quantum gravity, but it's still in early development. Nobody has any idea yet. So yeah, one day hopefully it will get figured out. But it's only been like what three, four decades since we cracked some of the mysteries. So just you know, just wait a little bit. I'm so I'm sure someone will figure it out. I'm sure someone will create some kind of a cool, cool. Uh, Artificial intelligence physicist that's going to just crack everything. Oh, someone mentioned Dr. Becky. Yeah, she, she does support academia with joy. And I, I agree. She, she, uh, her and Sabine are very different in her approach. And I, I like both. I mean, I, I honestly don't see the... Uh, people have opinions and people can be grumpy. You know, like I had a grumpy day yesterday and um, it happens, you know. And especially if, if your colleagues don't support you and uh, it's understandable that someone will get upset. So I, I, I don't really... I don't get into those. That's why I'm not in academia. It was too much, too much of that political stuff for me. Okay, someone is asking about dark matter. This is from Rerog. Is there a chance that there is no dark matter as some particles, but gravity force or something in another dimension? If we would be 2D creatures, we would sense gravity or something else. So um, I, I try to clarify this in most dark matter videos, and I guess I'll do this again. Um, the, the idea of dark matter is not that it's... So some scientists, some scientists believe it's a particle. Some scientists believe it's a formula thing. In reality, we actually know, have no idea. It's, it's just the name of a concept. And the concept here is that we, we can see the effects. We see the lensing effects from different, different distant galaxies. We see the effects of um, the way the stars rotate around galaxies. We see the effects from uh, the uh, ancient parts of the universe, um, from the uh, cosmic microwave background. Those effects can only be explain, explained if you have this concept known as dark matter. It's not, it could be a particle. We haven't found one yet. It could be uh, some kind of an interpretation of maybe gravitational physics. Uh, at the moment, we just, there's really no definitive answer. But the theory that's kind of making rounds now, or I guess a hypothesis, uh, is the one in regards to axions. They, they're, coming, they're coming back, axions are coming back which is basically like a tiny particle, so, so, so small, so low in mass that it starts acting like a very, very long wave. And when you put them all together, they become like a bigger wave and they eventually they start having these wavy quantum effects. Maybe they're right, maybe not. At the moment, I don't think there's an answer. Um, we'll, we'll find out. I, I'm sure, you know, if we have so many telescopes being launched in the next um, five years, I'm sure we'll find out. Okay, thank you so much, Tyler. Thank you for the donation. Thank you for all your work. Uh, you inspired me to pursue a hobby in astronomy. Yes, I did my job. Uh, I hope to one day teach about it, and I'm currently saving up for post grad school. Thank you. That's awesome. Honestly, this is exactly what I'm. I mean, I started as a teacher myself, and I was hoping to encourage others to join in, because teaching is hard, first of all, but also teaching is awesome. Um, but someone needs to do it, right? And I'm gonna be doing it once again when I quit YouTube at some point, if I do quit. I, actually, I think it's going to be the other way around. When YouTube quits me, uh, I think at some point, if something happens to YouTube, I'm going back to teaching. Uh, at the moment, no. This is this is good. Uh, Viratan is asking, uh, what do you think our galaxy would look like after the Andromeda Milky Way collision? Um, well, NASA did the simulations, and I, you, there's even an old old video they have uh, where they kind of show you that. Let me see if I can find it though. Oh wait, not here. Let me see if I can. Oh, I lost it. Let me see if I can find the video of the uh, Andromeda galaxy collision. And it's it's just going to look like a blob, basically. Is it here? Yeah. Whoa, how do I? I have to move this here somehow. 
How do I move this here? Professional, professional streamer. Uh, okay, that's so funny. I have no idea. This is from, this is a NASA video from videos from space.com because everybody always steals NASA videos. So we have the Milky Way galaxy right here. Oh, wait, move myself. Here we go. We have the Milky Way galaxy right here. This is in billions of years from now. And then here, here, here comes the Andromeda somewhere. Here it is, it's coming. So this is actually like, oh, can you see the billions of years here? Yeah, there we go. This is in billions of years from now. And so approximately like three to maybe four billion years from now, uh, they're going to start they're going to start colliding. And then within, within a few billion years, they should join in. Oh, this is, this is that galaxy I mentioned before. This is the triangulum. It's supposed to join in as well. And then here somewhere, so that's, that's the final image. Um, and yeah. So that's what we think maybe is going to happen, kind of. But you know, those are simulations. We don't actually have the exact shape of our own galaxy, so we don't know. Um, from what, what we know about um, the shape of the Milky Way, based on Gaia observations, it seems to be more crooked and more bent compared to what we imagined before. So there's, it's going to be very difficult to imagine exactly what all of this is going to look like. But we don't know. Um, cool. Next question. Oh, that's an, wow, that's an awesome, awesome question. Okay, Christopher Rodriguez. Does photosynthesis stop during the eclipse? It does. Um, it does for a pretty long time. It stops, it basically starts stopping before the eclipse. And then I think it shuts down for over an hour after the eclipse. And the trees once again also freak out kind of. Um, and the thing is, animals that can sense the oxygen slash CO2 uh, they, they react differently. They react very differently from other animals. For example, that's what, why we believe dogs react a little bit differently because they can maybe sense the smell of the trees suddenly changing. But um, there are no like exact sort of specifications for what happens to trees, for what happens to plants in general. But they all definitely stop photosynthesis completely. They shut down. Um, next. Uh, so House of Castriotti is saying, it would be cool to see me and Brian Cox to have a conversation. Perhaps you can reach out to him. Uh, Brian Cox, along with a lot of other celebrities, usually require a payment for, for uh, any kind of a sort of communication. That includes uh, people like, uh, well, actually, most, most scientists that, you know, like Bill Nye, the science guy, he's probably going to charge uh, quite, a, quite, a, quite a big uh, bill there for, for attending. Um, but yeah, I just don't really, and it's difficult to organize and the money is a problem. And also because we're in different locations, uh, yeah, it's hard. It's hard to organize those, but I would love to talk to him. I'm not sure about what, but, um, yeah, it would, it would be cool to do any kind of a stream. I've done a lot of streams with, um, uh, who did I did? I did a lot of streams with Fraser Kane and uh, a few other, um, YouTubers. But that's so much easier, mostly because people like him already know how to do streams with uh, YouTubers, so it's a lot easier that way. Um, cool. Uh, Robbie Roach, uh, would you live in a combined aftermath galaxy if given the option? Uh, we actually, well, no, we, planet Earth, assuming that it's still around, is not going to uh, is not going to feel a difference. There's not going to be much difference. The star, um, the distance between stars is so extremely large that it's astronomically unlikely that anything will come close to the solar system. Um, but uh, by then, uh, five billion years, uh, our sun is going to be in a slightly different uh, shape and is going to mo possibly destroy planet Earth, possibly. Um, why and when does photosynthesis start again? I mean, it obviously it restarts right after the um, sun comes out completely, but the exact time I'm not sure about, to be honest. Um, I think the trees, I mean, for them, it's just another nighttime, miniature nighttime. Um, someone is asking me if I believe in God and Tom Cruise. No to both. I don't know. It's like with God, it's with faith in general. It's such a loaded question. It's, you know, everyone believes in something. Tom Cruise, he actually came to South Korea uh, a few months ago. He was literally right next to my um, house and I had no idea. So I don't believe he exists because I didn't see him. 
Tom Cruise is not real. Um, next. Space Times, Matt O'Dodd would be a cool crossover. He actually has mentioned me many, many times. I would love to talk to him as well. But PBS is, once again, um, they don't do streams. Well, OK, they do streams sometimes. Um, but with them, because it's a, it's a publicly uh, funded company, as in like it's a you know, public broadcasting company, I don't think the, the, uh, it's, it, there's a lot of different things you have to do to be able to, to appear in their videos. And also not American. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not a US citizen. So it will be very difficult. Thank you so much, Rowan Budai, for the donation um, and the comment. Thank you, wonderful person. Your videos help me keep the spirit of curiosity and awe uh, alive and thriving. Are there any particular philosophical or spiritual ideologies that appeal to my rational brain? Um, philosophical and spiritual. I mean, I tend to th I tend to basically turn science into that philosophy and spirituality. You know, so okay, this is going to be this is going to sound really uh, weird, I guess, and sad and. Uh, but, you know, uh, I mentioned m before that my mom passed away um, a decade ago, but also when my son passed away, I had to find a way to deal with it. And one way I tend to think of it is uh, a kind of a spirituality of multiverse. You know, we know that scientifically speaking, it's possible multiverse can exist. And if it does exist, then somewhere out there in one of those multiverses, they're still alive and well, and they're doing their thing. And sometimes it's good to think that. And uh, it's a kind of a spirituality and it helps me, you know, not go crazy. Um, but in terms of evidence, uh, there's now more evidence for multiverse than anything else. So I, I don't know. It's, it's, a, it's hard to answer that. In terms of, in terms of philosophy, I, obviously I took a lot of philosoph philosophy classes in college like everyone else, but nothing really appealed to me, to be honest. A lot of, a lot of it was, a lot of it ended up being so cynical at the end. It's like, okay, so you're saying everything is meaningless. So cool. And I, that wasn't me. I, I, want, I want to believe in something more positive. Uh, thank you for the donation, Nod, or N-O-D. So someone is asking if Space Engine is free. Space Engine is free on their website, but it's an older version. It used to be free, and uh, now they started charging money because many people actually s suggested that because it was an awesome app, and they needed to raise money, and it improved so much since they started charging money. So I, I'm totally okay supporting them. Space Engine is awesome. That's the app I have running right here. And oh, let's check if let's check if the shadow is here. No, not here yet. Um, as I'm, if you're just tuning in, this right here is a real-time simulation of the total eclipse 2024 in Space Engine. That's just in case, uh, in case there's like clouds and we don't have good view of the real eclipse uh, from any of the telescopes. But yeah, not happening yet. We still have like. I guess an hour-ish. Oh, that no, wait, sorry. We have 45 minutes before the NASA stream starts. And then I, I believe at that point we have maybe, a, maybe like an hour more. I don't know. Um, OK, moving on. Um, Naranja is asking, I'm interested in studying physics. I want to do a review of one of my research papers. I'm going to cite you as my inspiration. Oh, thank you for pursuing research. That's awesome. But you really shouldn't. I mean, you, you don't have to. I don't think I don't think I do enough to inspire actual physicists, though. Maybe normal people, but anyway. Uh, cool. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, OK, let's see if I have any more comments or questions I missed. Uh, mm -mm -mm. OK. Uh, all right. Here we go. This is a, oh, we have a new, new question. Did I miss any questions? Solar Knight is asking, will solar uh, farms lose money during the eclipse? Ah, that's, huh, hmm. Yeah, I think they will. Um, the funny thing about solar farms that I recently found out about by doing research for my wife's company, um, they are very tricky uh, to integrate into the electric, um, what's that called, network, I guess, because solar, solar uh, farms usually only make money during daytime. At night, they obviously make nothing. And 
you have to start using you know power plants for example fossil burning power plants to, to generate electricity at night but those plants require hours and hours of preparation to start working and so they end up losing so much more money and so there's a kind of, there's a kind of a battle going on between the solar power plants and other power plants because either you have too much electricity coming from everywhere or you have not enough electricity coming from uh, the uh, non-solar power plants and that ends up dramatically reducing the total energy available to the entire city, for example. And so with photovoltaic farms, I can only imagine uh, places like California, where there's probably a lot, they might actually have a lot of trouble with the power grid during the eclipse because it suddenly will collapse the entire grid for like over an hour and um, the other power plants are not as available, so you have no energy coming from anywhere. So I'm sure there's going to be some interesting discussions going on. <clears throat> But I could be wrong. I, I'm, not, I'm not an expert on this. Thank you so much, Ghostwriter, for the uh, donation. And thank you so much, Hi.3. And I believe there is a ooh, what? comment. Thank you. There is no ledge to knowledge. There's no ledge to knowledge indeed. Thank you, Gertan Eisenk. Uh, thank you for all you've taught me and for the inspiration and love from Netherlands. That's one place I've never visited yet. I want to go to Netherlands. But it's hard because I have kids. Uh, I think in, in about two years, I'll be traveling a little bit more once my son and... We, uh, okay, so one thing is that you might notice that I'm a little bit tired and also possibly in some of my videos, I started getting like dark eyes and whatever. Uh, a year ago, my wife gave birth to a daughter. And so now we have a, a, a one-year-old daughter to give us a lot of happiness, but also, oh my God, she, she is so different from our son. She's all over the place. So we don't sleep. We don't sleep at all anymore. I'm super tired. Uh, but, you know, you, you got to do what you have to do. Uh, am I going to do more videos on chemistry? Chemistry uh, is not really my strength, to be honest. But I, I sometimes try to integrate it into other stuff. Uh, I think there, are, I mean, there's that other YouTube channel that does so much better than, than my channel. So I'm sure they, they did most of the chemistry topics already. And also with chemistry, in terms of discoveries, it's very challenging because there's not much there except for maybe like nanotechnology stuff or material science and that is just way beyond my uh, level of level of ignorance i when i read material science papers i kind of just phase out um is it pr is it possible to have a permanent solar eclipse richard is asking the question um, i'm not sure what you mean by permanent like as in it's always there because no that that would be impossible unless you positioned the object in the Lagrange point between the planet and the st star. So let's go to Lagrange points. Here we go. Um, there's the, so in terms of orbital dynamics, there are several points that we have that are kind of stable-ish. These are called Lagrange points after the French uh, scientists who discovered them. So we have the L1 and L2 points, and this is planet Earth, this is the moon, and this is the sun. L2 point is where we have a lot of telescopes like Gaia, James Webb, some other ones. Um, and L1 is where there are some other telescopes studying the sun, but also if you place something here, it can create a, a permanent eclipse, but the moon is not even close to that location. Uh, this is only about just over 300,000 kilometers. And this is like 1.5 million kilometers, so five times as far. So when and if the moon ever gets to that point, that will become interesting. Um, but from what I remember reading, calculating, slash doing research on, by the time that moon can get that far, the Earth is no longer going to be around because the sun is going to enlarge and going to become a red giant. So yeah, probably, I would say no. Maybe in some other star systems, yes, not in this one. So yeah. Next question, comment and concern. Um, any cool new theories on G2 anomaly? No, not that I've heard of. I have that saved as my topic. G2 anomaly is one of the strange anomalies they discovered in the particle accelerators. Uh, there's a video from like a year and a half ago about it, but no, there's nothing that I've heard of recently. Cool. Next common question concern. Thank you so much, Daniel Hughes, for the donation. And also, who? Uh, wait, I missed one. 
Did I miss one? What is this? Roy Pledge. Hello from Ottawa, Canada. Thank you so much. Watch all your videos. Just about to drive south to see totality, hoping the clouds fall off. Man, I'm kind of jealous. I, I wish I could do that too. I, I, w I was so close to going to the US uh, to, to visit. Um, but kids is one reason I didn't go. But second reason is that it is ridiculously expensive. It feels like everybody is going to the US, uh, US slash Canada right now. Uh, the tickets were like over $3,000 just to visit. Too much. Can't afford it. Um, thank you so much, Jolie Roger, um, for the donation. I've subscribed to you for a long time. Thank you for bringing science back into my life. You're welcome. Uh, I live to please. It's basically my job now. Um, uh, v Totas J. Thank you for the donation. And I think there's a question. How can all mass of observable universe fit in observable universe? If that mass with density as a black hole wouldn't fit in... If that mass with density as a black hole wouldn't fit in an observable universe, we live in a black hole? Question. Um, so I, I, guess, I guess you're asking, do we live in a black hole? So there was, a, there was actually a study about that. I think I made a video about it too, that n mentioned that technically the total mass of the entire universe does actually appear kind of like as if we were lived in a black hole. However, we most likely don't live in one because... Um, what, what was the conclusion from the paper? I'm trying to remember. The conclusion was that we don't live in a black hole because the... Huh. Okay, I'm, I'm drawing a blank. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm going to find it. Study suggests we live in a black hole. Uh, no, that's not it. Life science... Save me life science. Can you please answer? Uh, what was the conclusion? I don't remember. I know that it wasn't. It wasn't the black hole. Uh, nah, it doesn't, it doesn't say anything. Okay, so anyway, so yeah, it's not, it's not a black hole. I'll come back and I'll mention it later. It's not a black hole. We're, we don't live in a black hole, almost for certain. But even though it does appear like we, we have the event horizon kind of, it's the horizon of, you know, expanding universe. We also have the total mass of the universe that kind of um, appears to resemble a black hole. But the conclusion was that it's not. Uh, Darren Schweiters, just wanted to let you know what a wonderful person you are. No, you are, Darren. You are. And I'm sorry if I'm starting to sound a little bit, uh, if I ramble too much, if I'm starting to sound tired. It is because it is now 1.30 a.m. where I am, and also because... I am a little bit sick. Uh, I have most likely some kind of a virus. Thank you so much, Damien Huber, for the donation. And thank you and have a great day to you as well. Okay. Uh, Robbie Roach, thank you. Thank you so much. Let's build a space station with a bar in the L1 point at Earth. Call it Lagrange Lounge. Oh, I like that. So, so one thing I didn't mention about Lagrange points is that they're not super stable. Like, you still cannot really stay there unless you... Uh, be because of the interaction with other other um, planets and other objects in the solar system, L1 and L2 points, so these two points, uh, they're not super stable. You can still kind of lose the um, orbit there. But these two, L4, L5, and L3, they are pretty stable. You can actually stay in those positions for thousands and millions of years. Whereas L1 and L2 points... Uh, all of the telescopes in those points, they still have to kind of reaccelerate once in a while, which is why actually, which is why the James Webb mission is not permanent. It only has like maybe 20 years maximum before the fuel runs out, so it still has to maintain its own orbit. So if you have a Lagrange lounge, as Robbie Roach suggests, in L1 point, um, it will be very expensive to renew it because you need a lot of fuel to maintain the orbit. But still, a cool idea, I think, maybe. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, Trig Ireland, thank you for the donation. And the question is, is Niven's ring world stable? Are there philosophical religious ideas that you like but think are probably on the balance of evidence untrue? Um, in terms of the ring world being stable, I don't think so. 
I think the tidal effects would destroy it. But it, it really depends on what you make there. So from what I remember, I don't remember the novels that well anymore, but from what I remember, the material was really strong. Um, and if you make it strong enough, obviously, but it was like super material that doesn't exist. Uh, so with any kind of a ring formation around a massive object, the tidal effects will usually disrupt the formation pretty quickly. So it'd be hard to uh, maintain a superstructure, which is why, you know, uh, scientists that always mention um, any kind of a superstructure around the star or anything to do with alien technology in massive proportions that's trying to harness the energy of a star, it just sounds a little bit too much because there's really no element we have that can withstand so much gravity from, from the star. Uh, I don't know, it's possible, but unlikely. I'm sorry, I, someone is mentioning that I missed a question. David Vega Bravo, I saw you, that you had a question, but I don't know where it is. I'm sorry, I can't see it. Where is it? Where is it? Can you ask it again, please? I'm sorry, I missed it. Uh, uh, Kirk is asking me what are Bailey's beads. Uh, Bailey's beads I showed previously are these really cool formations right here visible for only a few seconds during the totality, and they're formed by the structures on the moon. Uh, basically, mountains, ridges, stuff like that. And uh, they're just like light passing through those, between those structures. Um, is it true that all the planets are within alignment in the solar system today? No, they're not. Planets are not aligned. It's super hard for planets to align. It's, it's a very unlikely event to happen. Um, so someone, oh, Poe Pap is asking, what are we going to do after 20 years of James Webb? I mean, we do have so many telescopes coming out even this year. So like, there's going to be a lot more. Don't worry. Also, by then, James Webb will have discovered most of the things that we want to discover. It's, it's really good at capturing data, so it's going to have so much data that scientists will have decades of work. Because it's, it's basically just looking at the same spot and capturing data, but it takes months to process it. Um, uh, someone is asking me about my spice tolerance in Korea. Yeah, it, it got built up pretty quickly. You have to be able to tolerate spicy food in anywhere in East Asia or you die, literally. Um, okay. Next. Do we know if there is any objects currently sitting in the L3 orbit? Uh, there are a few uh, so-called, um, they're not called pseudomoons, they're called uh, quasi-moons. There are a few quasi-moons in the, in, in the other Lagrange points. So if I go back to Lagrange points, these usually contain, th these usually contain, oh, sorry, L3, no, uh, L3, I don't think there's anything we've found yet. L5 and L4 have uh, quasi-moons. But in L3, um, I don't think anything has ever been found. There might be something, though, because it's a stable point, but nothing that I can think of. It would be, it would actually would be a pretty big discovery, so I don't think it's ever been found. Um, yes, yes, just to, re just to answer the question again, I'm currently in South Korea, so that's why it's solely here. Um, someone's asking me if I like sci-fi. I used to love sci-fi, but because of, you know, work and life, it's just impossible to have time to read anything anymore. And most of the books I've read, even like my, obviously my favorite books would be the, the, the classics foundation and, um, uh, Asimov's books, but I barely remember anything from them. So I, I, I was, I was kind of embarrassed that I had to rewatch the TV show just to, just to kind of remember, just to try to recall what Foundation was about, because I, I was kind of familiar with it, but I totally forgot the main ideas. So yeah, love it, but no time. Sci-fi sci is awesome though, has definitely uh, led us to a lot of new discoveries just through inspiration alone. Um. Cool. Next. Um, next, next, next. Is uh, Carl Capo, thank you so much for the donation. Is the eclipse a form of a black hole sun? No, no, it's not. Um, eclipse is really just a shadow. It's nothing, nothing more, nothing less. Uh, 
nothing to do with black holes, nothing to do with anything extraordinary. Um, it is a completely accidental arrangement of two space objects that seem to be the same size, and once in a while, um, they seem to correspond, or basically they seem to align uh, the concept known as syzygy, a very funny word. Just an alignment. Interestingly, you're supposed to get exactly the same eclipse um, every 18.5 years because of the alignment. But it's never in the same spot, though. It's always different spots. Uh, do I have any favorite science fiction authors? Uh, at the moment, I really can't answer that because I haven't read a single book in such a long time. Most of my reading nowadays is just papers. I just read studies um, for YouTube and for mo most of the... Uh, most of my interest now is just discovering what we have discovered. Not, not as much as, like, I would love to know what a science fiction story is about, but at this point, I just want to know what, what the reality is. Um, I still watch sci-fi shows, though, once in a while, just, just to have a little bit, a bit of a break. But reading, though, is, is a completely different story. No time. Red Portal, very important question. Thank you for the donation. And the question is, have you watched Three Body Problem yet? How do you feel it compared to the books if you've read them? The science in the books blew my mind. So those are the books I've actually kind of read, not, not fully, but skimmed through most of them. Um, and it, it, was, it was good. I'm going to say it's good. The TV show is really good too. And the video is coming out in two days. So I don't want to spoil it. You're gonna, you're gonna, I, I just finished editing the video today right before the stream. And I'm going to talk about it a little bit. But in terms of the actual ideas... They are, they are very science fiction-y. Uh, I, I would just be very honest with you. A lot of science in the books is unfortunately unproven or hypothetical. It's even the three-body itself, a uh, three-body problem itself. Um, okay, for those of you who are not going to watch the video, uh, there are several systems we know in the, Mil in the Milky Way galaxy that have the actual three-body problem star arrangement, and none of them are capable of maintaining stability for more than 50 million years. And during that time, there's absolutely no way you can have a planet, no matter what kind of planet it is, uh, to have an orbit for longer than that. Um, so once the three-body problem disappears and once the system becomes stable, that's when usually you have planetary formation. But not always. A lot of, a lot of binary systems that have gone through a three-body problem, or basically there are many different stars orbiting around, they never acquire planets. They just remain solitary. Someone is mentioning I look differently. Huh, what about now, huh? It's the glasses. Uh, and I need them because the ta uh, I have a monitor that's very, very high resolution. I need it for work. And unfortunately, I cannot read the text. It's just too small. And I don't know how to make it bigger. I'm going to blame YouTube for this. Um, who is my idol? I don't know if I have an idol, Victor Lo Perena. However, I would say one person I would really like. I mean, I mean, I would love to have a conversation with is Feynman, Richard Feynman, um, because he's different. Of all the scientists out there, you know, Einstein, uh, Edison, whatever, you, wh whatever, whoever you want to think of as a scientist, Feynman is unique, and his train of thought was unique, and he was just out of uh, really out there. He he was able to come up with things that nobody else even remotely approached. And when I read his letters to his wife or when I read things he wrote, it's just mind-blowing. It's something I would love to um, explore more from, you know, in terms of psychology, how he was able to come up with the stuff he came up with. But yeah, you know, not going to happen, unfortunately. Maybe we can make a Feynman AI I can talk to. Um, Next question, uh, uh, Vitatos J, thank you so much again. And the question is, what universe is flat statement? Oh, what, what, does, what does universe is flat means, right? Is that what you're asking? We can measure by experiment by making triangle or distant objects, and if we see it, it's equal 180, it's flat. Okay, so the curvature you're referring to is the curvature of the universe in terms of space-time, not in terms of the actual... Um, not in terms of the actual like geography or anything like that. How do I demonstrate this? Let me let me think. Can I look up space-time curvature? Is it going to help me? Um, I guess that kind of helps. Maybe 
I don't know. ESA has a picture here. Oh, come on. Here we go. Uh, so this is what they mean by flat space-time, flat universe, flat structure. In that flat space-time, you'll have objects that create a bit of a curvature. However, for the most part, it's flat. And that means that in, in regards to universe, if you go straight and you keep going straight, you should be going straight. You'll never be able to come back to the same location. When, when they say the universe may not be flat, as in it's curved in some way, um, it means that if you keep going in the same direction at some point, <coughs> my apologies, uh, at some point you're going to come back to the same location and you're not even going to feel it because it's like space-time bending, not you bending and not, not anything around you bending. And so the measurements that the scientists have conducted uh, in the last decades, few decades, all suggest that the universe seemed to be flat for the most part. And that means, that actually means two things, it implies two major things, or at least two. Um, one is that um, it could be extremely big, like the non-observable universe may be thousands and millions of times bigger than the observable universe. So you know the universe that we see, the sort of like the edges that the James Webb has seen, there could be like hundreds and even thousands of times more things beyond us that we just don't see anymore. And that's the unobservable universe, the universe we can no longer see. So that's one implication. The other implication is that uh, we have no idea how big it is. We have no idea how, why it's this way. And we obviously have no idea if it's truly flat because if it's super, super big, it could still be not flat. It could be just a little bit bent, but we just can't see it. And that means that if you go in a certain direction and you go past the observable universe, you could technically come back to the same spot. It's just, yeah, it's, it's a complicated topic. Th there is a video in a, somewhere in, in the description, uh, sorry, not the description, somewhere in the older catalog. I'll try to post it in the description if I remember. Uh, that kind of explains it better. I probably didn't do a good job. Uh, usually I read through the script, uh, from a script, so uh, sorry. But anyway, so we think it's flat and we think that the universe is very big, very, very big, bigger than we can see. Hopefully that answered it. Um, cool story. Um, Mordor, thank you so much for the donation. Thank you for your work. I always look forward to your daily videos. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Kyle Castleberry, thank you so much. I've been watching your content for years. Thank you for amazing educational content. What's your opinion on Starlink and interference? Well, I made a video about this today. Um, my opinion about Starlink in general is that it is killing careers. Um, I mean, it's great that we have internet and stuff, especially in remote locations. Uh, but it's, so Starlink is basically bringing, so if it's just Starlink, okay, we can, we can deal with that. But it's bringing competition from Amazon, from other companies. So we might end up with like thousands of different satellites and not just thousands, almost a million satellites orbiting around, providing internet, providing whatever communication, which suddenly destroys careers of a lot of astronomers, a lot of scientists that possibly deal with um, astronomical observations. And most importantly, uh, it, it might potentially have certain causes on the upper atmosphere. As I mentioned in the video today, um, there are links to certain atmospheric particles that seem to be left by those satellites as they re-enter. And a lot of them may have certain chemical reactions in the upper atmosphere that might affect things like ozone. So another ozone hole, uh, they might affect things like ionosphere and one study that we don't know much about, it's just a suggestion. One study suggested that, okay, well, maybe it also may decrease magnetosphere. And th that, is, that is a big maybe. Uh, and also it's a big concern. If, magne if it affects magnetosphere at all, y you know you want to do something about it. Like this is, this is a, definitely a question we have to try to answer. So as I mentioned in the video, it's a good topic, but because there are no studies, that's basically the conclusion. We have to have more studies and someone has to find a way to analyze this, find a way to maybe change satellites in certain ways to not produce those particles um, or maybe limit the number. There has to, like, you don't have to have a million satellites to have good internet. So I guess that's kind of my opinion. Moderation, there you go. I don't know, I, I, don't, I don't use Starlink. Uh, anyone in the city, usually has better internet than Starlink can provide and it's much cheaper. But that's just me. Um, okay, moving on. Um, mm, mm, mm. 
Okay, so what did I miss? I missed a bunch of stuff, didn't I? <coughs> uh, thank you, Matesh Steinhardt. I, your name got cut off, sorry. Steinhauser. Ah, sorry. What if the universe is just a big spherical firework? Um, well, okay, so one thing that I feel like is being misrepresented in a lot of media is that the universe has some kind of a spherical shape or it has, um, I don't know, it's, it has like a structure. And one thing that I always find difficult to imagine myself is that we have to remember the, the light travels at a certain speed. And because of that, the information also travels at a certain speed. And because of that, you can't really talk about the entire universe as like one single object because by the time something happens on the other side, it's already completely different. And so this is sort of like the idea of the you know, subjective reality slash uh, theory of relativity. Everything is relative. You have to always focus on just one frame. You can only explain your own frame of reference. It's, it's super difficult to imagine what's outside of this. And so even calling the universe spherical, I don't like, we don't know, it's, it might be, but based on the curvature, it could also be all like wobbly and stuff. And it depends on the amount of material between us and the edge. And so, yeah, I don't know. It's, and it's in terms of firework, uh, it was a firework in the beginning. Uh, and that's what the CMB is, the cosmic microwave background, uh, which if you've never seen it before, it looks like this the first, first light from the entire universe. Uh, that's what we see here. Um, and that's, that's basically the, you know, the, the fireworks. And then the fireworks started to cool down and the universe cooled down and matter started forming. But in terms of shape, yeah, I always have trouble figuring, like, I don't know, I don't know how to, I don't know how to answer the shape question. However, um, it is definitely big and it's definitely complicated and extremely, extremely difficult to imagine. Would you, eat a, would you eat a pizza with pineapple on it? I don't mind it. Mm. I, I mean, Hawaiian pizza, according to some people, is an abomination, but I don't mind it. It's okay. However, if you ever come to South Korea, the local, uh, I guess, delicacy is corn pizza, and that, that is a different story. I cannot do corn on pizza. Ha uh, Hawaiian pizza is okay, though. Um, cool. And... Next, what else did I miss? I'm sorry if I missed your question. I, it's the, with the comments on YouTube. It's just so hard to to organize this because I'm trying to scroll through them, and some of the comments kind of um, get scrolled automatically, and so I have to scroll back to see what I missed. Um, okay, someone is asking about uh, dark matter. Can I explain how dark matter might be a form of matter that has negative pressure? You're talking about dark energy, I think. Dark energy might have negative pressure um, and could be used to create wormholes. So with wormhole creation, it's not really the, yeah, it's, it's the hypothetical negative energy, not, not dark energy. So if dark energy is negative energy, then maybe we can use this to repel the minuscule, um, wormhole mouths to prevent them from basically closing. But that's super hypothetical. And there was, a st there was that article, not, not a study, article like a few years ago that someone created a wormhole in a supercomputer or something like that. I don't remember. Um, it, it was really not. It was just such a, such a loaded article that presented something that was totally not true. Um, they, they created something that appeared in terms of numbers as a wormhole, but it was not even a real, like it, it was just a simulation. Um, Anyway, so wormholes, as we think right now, may possibly not exist. And one of the reasons um, is basically because there's no observational evidence. From what was predicted before is uh, wormholes are basically, are supposed to be some of the brightest objects out there they're, because they're expelling all of the stuff. And so originally some scientists thought that maybe quasars are wormholes, but so far, every quasar seen so far is, is a black hole. So no wormholes as we know, as we th as, uh, from all of the evidence at least. Anyway. Uh, okay, so Sigma one is mentioning that uh, I missed two questions. So here's the thing, I, I, this is a bit of a, I guess, um, apology. There's no way for me to scroll through your comments individually and 
if I scroll up and I don't see a question, um, I, I just I just can't see it. it is, I don't even know where it is, to be honest. I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm just going to apologize. Not, nothing I can say here. What is my favorite subset of math? Naranja. Um, I don't know if I have one. I mean, I, I don't know if I have one. I'm sorry. It, I've taught calculus for a long time, so I guess that. But I, don't, I wouldn't call it super favorite. Um, what if universe is just a big sphere? Oh, wait, I read that already. I'm back here. No. <coughs> my apologies. Um, okay. Isn't the eclipse... Isn't the eclipse... Oh, okay. Uh, so, Ginto Cruz won. Thank you. And the question is, isn't the eclipse a round slit recreating the double slit experiment, causing the shadow bands that are rarely seen? Or am I crazy? Um... So you're talking about, are you talking about this? I guess you're talking about this. Where is it? Come back. So these shadow V uh, features that are formed um, on the ground during the eclipse are not really the same as the double slit experiment. Um, it, it, it's essentially just, it, it is a shadow from different types of um, pinholes but it's not the same effect as the double slit experiment. It has not, I don't think it has anything to do with quantum physics as far as I know. Uh, but, but you know, for all I know, maybe there is some uh, effect going on here. Uh, these, are, these are things that you can actually see on the ground during the totality, and uh, normally it's supposed to be like super beautiful, but I think these are just created by the shadows of different objects, not really in the same way as, um, as the double slit experiment. Um, okay, Jared, uh, Schreckengast, thank you so much. And the comment here, I can make text bigger by selecting system display scale layout, change the size. Yeah, so I know, I, I kind of know how to change the scaling. The problem is it changes all of my scaling for all of my apps and then suddenly all of the images become super big and uh, I tried it before. I don't know, I'll have to figure out. If we do streaming more often, uh, I'm gonna get, become more professional, I'm sorry. Um, do I, uh, it's okay, Matesh Steinhauser. Uh, do you believe that, thank you so much, and uh, do you believe that time is located in fourth dimensional space, some plasma or something unknown affecting our universe? Um, I mean, it, it is a fourth dimensional space as far as we understand. I don't know if there's any um, plasma in, related there. Uh, with, with terms of, in terms of imagining four dimensional space and um, space time, it, usually I think just seeing it as a kind of a, um, progression along the 3D space is the best sort of way to imagine it, basically a timeline. Uh, but honestly, it's one of those questions that it's like, we think it's, it's just a <clears throat> fourth dimension, but it's hard to prove that, you know? Um, let me see if I can maybe find an image of some sort. Uh, four dimensional time picture. So, okay. There are a lot of really good physics videos that usually kind of show us the uh, visualization for this, but I just, I don't have them right now on me. Anyway, I'll, I'll make a video about this at some point. There are a lot of videos on space time that I have uh, planned, so we'll talk about it. I'm sorry, I, I don't have an answer for this right now. Um, cool. Okay, what did I miss, what did I miss, what did I miss? Uh, okay, let's make this bigger. Is this starting yet? No. Where did it go? Okay, so um, in about seven minutes, I think we're gonna have a bunch of streams coming up from NASA and, and other um, uh, different organizations, including one of the biggest telescopes in the US. So I'm gonna shut up during that time. I wanna hear what they say. Um, Let's go back to top chats, comments. Okay, here we go. Uh, oops, oopsie, that's not the right button. Okay, so here, I'm gonna go to the next question if I can find it. Um, cool. Okay, so I missed a few people. Thank you so much, Robert O. 
Sour Girl and Kyle Castleberry. Oh, I already did that one. Anyway, if you have any last questions before the stream starts, post them in like, I don't know, caps or something so I can see them. It's, you would be surprised how difficult it is to see every comment. So usually a lot of um, streamers, professional streamers, which I'm not, um, they, they will usually have some sort of a person telling them what the questions and comments are. That's, that's how they're able to answer them. I don't have anyone right next, to, uh, right next to me to help me. I'm sorry. I'll do better. I promise. Um, okay, more space-time questions. Is it expanding or could it be just expansion of space? I'll answer some of the space-time questions in one of the future videos. There's actually one that that's, I'm working on right now. Um, but yeah, there's, there's so many ways to imagine it. It's, it's just a little bit challenging um, to really visualize it as a, with the human brain. Um, and as far as I know, there are no good simulations that really help us. Um, okay. Uh, hello, those of you who are just tuning in and stuff. Also, also, okay, so everyone's telling me to do control mouse wheel plus. Yeah, see that just increase everything. I'll try, I'll try this, okay. Um, anyway, moving on, let's see. Hello, 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 wonderful everybody. Hello, wonderful people. And also, uh, did you miss a cheesy joke? No, I mean, yeah, okay, you missed two. They were super cheesy, so please don't, don't go back. Um, okay, more questions about white holes. Uh, I mean, we kind of covered that, but honestly, white holes as of now are just a hypothesis. There's really, there's really nothing we we um, we know about them. We've never seen them. They don't seem to exist in terms of evidence. So I'm gonna say, just probably not real. At least in in this observable universe, there does not seem to be any proof. Um. Okay, is it starting? No, not yet. Cool, cool. Oh yeah, that's that's cool. Yeah, so use use that question mark for the for the questions, the, the question emoticon. It's so much easier to see. Thank you. Um. Yeah. Okay, so that's oh, that's a good question. Okay, D Best is asking about great attractor. What do I think it is? Um. Honestly, I don't think it's anything. I think it's just a kind of a. So you know how all of the galaxies in, um, in the large galactic constellation or galactic um, cluster, they'll usually move in a certain direction. And so the, at the same time, they kind of create a gravitational vector. And so what I think, and it's based, it's based on a lot of um, scientific evidence, it seems to be just a connection of vectors from different directions. So galaxies from here are going this way and galaxies from here are going this way. And they all seem to be pointing at one direction and that kind of reinforces the strength of that gravitational center. There might be nothing there. And from what we see behind the, it's, it's sort of, so it's, we cannot see it directly because it's behind the Milky Way dust area, uh, the zone of exclusion as it's known. Um, and it, if, you, um, if you look at this location, which I'm gonna try to show you right now because there's a picture from Caltech that I know is pretty good. It's supposed to be like, kind of like here-ish, but there seems to be nothing there. And so because of, I guess, once again, no evidence of anything being there, uh, which you would expect from a really massive, really condensed object, uh, today it's believed to be just a vector. And as a, as a definition of this vector, uh, this connection, um, because so many galaxies are moving toward it, we now have this superstructure that we call Laniakea, which is, by definition, our home, um, and also a supercluster where we all live. <laughs> I mean, we all live. If there is anyone else here, yeah, they also live here. Um, it's basically all of these galaxies, there's like 100,000 of them, and they're all moving toward the central point, which is a gravitational point. And that's basically what we think is called I mean, we know it's called, uh, we call it a great attractor, but we think it's just a point of a kind of a connection. 
I don't think, so yeah, I don't think there's anything there. I think it's empty. Or, I mean, there's probably dust and stuff, but no, no, no major structures. Um, what is my favorite snack? Uh, I had it here before. I just found it recently. So there's this really, really, really good spicy popcorn only available in Korea. I really like it. Um, thank you so much, Flick. And thank you so much, uh, Willin Out. Um, thank you for all I do, for, for all you do, and all your videos. I love your stuff and you provide and show us. Thank you, buddy. No, thank you. Thank you for the comment and the donation. Um, is it wrong to think that using time in grand scale of things is simply wrong and goes exponentially wrong? Uh, I mean, we still don't understand time, to be honest. It, it, it's, for us, for humans, it's just such a loaded concept. So I'm, I just can't answer this. I, I honestly, I don't know. But time, it's like we, nobody knows what it is. I don't think. Um, oh, that's a good question. William, what is the biggest filter when it comes to intelligent life? The biggest filter. So when it comes to specifically intelligent life, there might be an answer right here on Earth. And uh, specifically, if we find a way to improve our archaeological abilities, um, mm -hmm. in, if we're able to go through like millions of years of history somehow, we can actually start, um, we, we can start compiling you know, all kinds of potential animals or animal life that might have been almost intelligent and find a way how it was, how it developed. Like, for example, you know, we know that, you know, octopuses and um, squid, they've developed their intelligence completely separately from everyone else, yet they're not there yet. You know, they're not building spaceships and um, Starlink satellites, uh, and they don't seem to have something. They're missing something. Uh, at the same time, we know that, you know, our cousins, chimps, don't do that either. So it seems to be only humans, and there is some kind of a connection. We just don't really know what it is yet. There's a video I'm making um, possibly in the next month or so that's going to touch on the topic of, you know, what is it that makes human brain so special and so different from non-human brain in terms of development. And one of the biggest discoveries was really there's a, just a few genetic mutations that make our brains just grow so much slower. We're basically just super slow. We develop super slowly. Our um, childhood, our ability to grow up is much longer than any other animal. It, like if you say you take a chimp and you, you take a human human person, um, a chimp matures much faster and their brain just stops growing, stops developing after I think about 12 years or something. Um, yet a human brain continuously, uh, I guess it's com continuously immature. It continuously re remains young and developing for many, many decades, which allows us to become us. Um, and so that that's one of the questions we can tackle when it comes to intelligence. Um, and that so the biggest filter here would be biological, I think. I think it's something to do with biology. I don't think it's, it's you know, you can still have life form somewhere else, maybe. But if, it hasn't, if intelligent life has not formed on Earth, now that's the question that we needs to be answered. Why not? Why, why are we the only species so far um, making rockets? Why, why do we not see any satellite remnants from dinosaurs or from, you know, species before us? So that, that's a question that needs to be tackled. Okay, cool. Um, mm. Right. Uh, a lot of scream. Oh, okay. So, House of Castility. Okay, so yeah, you asked me to read the comment that um, subscribers. Oh no, sorry. Streamers will only read your comments if you donate uh, because it's easy to read. That's true. But honestly, I will read all comments. I, I donations are always welcome, but it is easier to read the comments if they're if they're donations but I'm not gonna encourage it. You, you guys do you. Not everybody can afford everything. Um, but thank you though, I really appreciate it. Um, wh why is, okay, it's two o'clock. Are you starting? Where's my stream? So in about like a few minutes, I'm gonna take a vocal break. I think it's, uh, yeah, I think it started official broadcast. And we're gonna, we're gonna, oh yeah, they're talking. We're gonna listen to what they have to say and then we're going to uh, maybe I'll make a few comments at the end. Okay. My apologies if I'm rambling now. It's been two hours. I'm getting a little bit tired. 2 a.m. 2 a.m. 
But yeah, I'll come back and talk more about this. Um, also, I probably should remove the chat from here. And OK, here we go. Here we go. NASA. of totality. Now we have a special guest that you might recognize popping in to share some important tips to make sure you stay safe during today's events. Hi Eclipse enthusiasts, Lance Bass here and I want to tell you how to protect those eyes and stay safe during a solar eclipse. During these celestial events, the sun, earth and moon are in sync creating solar eclipses. You can look directly at the sun during a total solar eclipse, but only when it's completely covered by the moon for a brief period known as totality. This is a really special moment. At all other times, you should wear eclipse glasses so that you don't say bye 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 to your vision. Seriously. And eclipse glasses are not the same as regular sunglasses. No, they're not. Safe solar viewers are thousands of times darker and will have a specific certification that you should look for right here. Don't be a space cowboy and try to look directly at the sun. If you don't have eclipse glasses, you can use an indirect viewing method, like a pinhole projector. You can make one of these with something as simple as an index card with a hole, or a colander, or even your hands. With the sun. Okay. <laughs> this was. This was too much. I'm sorry. It's too cheesy. I can't handle it. Uh, NSYNC? Really? This is for like when I was young. Nobody knows NSYNC anymore. Okay. Anyway, on a more serious note, um, there is actually another. I'm going to. I'm going to post this in the chat. There's another stream that you can watch. That's just the actual sun itself. Let me show you what it looks like. It does not have the, the comments in chat and stuff. Um, and you can actually watch that. That's maybe a little bit better for some of you. Uh, it froze. Great. Huh? Professional. Oh, look at my hair. It's all transparent. Um, where do you go? Here we go. So the actual streams right now are packed, so they're going to be super slow. But this one, I believe, just has music and the sun. And that's what I want to see, too. It's actually, pretty, it's actually pretty cool. Much better. So this is maybe what we should be watching. As much as I used to like NSYNC, I, I am 42 years old now. I can't do it anymore. I'm sorry. I love you, but no. Uh, so, okay. Hopefully you can hear this. There's also music, very calming music that I'm going to play right now. I don't know if you can hear it, but I can hear it. Uh, anyway, so I'm actually, not, I'm going to turn off the music because uh, it's a little bit too loud. Wait, here we go. Uh, and the one... Um, the one link I'm going to post in the description that hasn't started yet, one stream that's really, really well, I'm hoping it's going to be really good, is by the NSF or National Science Foundation. Their stream starts in 40 minutes. Um, they also have relatively good um, telescopes and stuff. Anyway, I'm back, kind of. I'm going to, I, yeah, I couldn't do it, I'm sorry. I, I thought they're going to have comments and cool science, but as soon as NSYNC showed up, I got reminded of my age, so I, I couldn't do it. I'm gonna come. I'm gonna answer a few more questions. And then we'll, we'll wait for we'll wait for some of the um, additional uh, scientists to show up because I actually want to hear what the, the they're probably gonna talk about um, Corona and stuff, and I want to hear what they have to say. Uh, or maybe they'll talk about the effects we've discussed earlier. Anyway, oh yes, people are asking me not to loop the sound again. I'm sorry. I don't know why it happened. Jesus. Actually, I, here I really have to blame YouTube. Something changed in the platform, the way you stream now, and I cannot figure out why it was looping. I just I kept trying to uh, um, change the sounds and stuff. I don't know. I don't know why it was looping. I'm going to erase this from the actual final video. Nobody's going to see this. This is just a stream thing. Uh, cool. Cool, 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 cool. Did I post this yet? No, here. If you actually want to watch the uh, this part, th this particular Eclipse video or stream, it's the link should be in the description. Well, I mean, the link should be in the uh, comments. Um, OK, so here we go. Backstreet, <laughs> Backstreet for life, yes. Um, 
But I, I, I'm okay. So here's the question. This is a serious question for anyone from NASA. W were other NSYNC members not available? I'm just curious. Why? 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 What happened to Timberlake? I guess he's really expensive now. Um, okay, um, so let's do a few more comments. I, I'm going to wait for maybe some more better videos, possibly from the um, National Science Foundation. But yeah, these are, these are, some, actually, these are some really good uh, videos here. I don't know if you can see what I see. You should be seeing what I'm seeing. I'm going to remove myself. This looks, this looks gorgeous. This is in Texas. Texas is the first state to witness the beautiful eclipse. But yeah, as you can see, it's super slow. If you've never, never seen this, it takes a very long time for the moon to approach the sun. Uh, right now, it's, it's moving like this way, and it's moving at, at approximately 2,000, 1,200 kilometers per, se uh, per, per hour. Uh, I was about to say per second, uh, per hour. So yeah, it's super slow, it's a huge object. But it will take a while to reach the uh, center. I think we have like maybe 40 minutes ish. And that means I'm going to read comments. Here we go. Uh, here we go. So yes, several of you mentioned that it's too cloudy in your location and that's actually expected. Um, I mean, April is not particularly sunny, so, um, yeah. Cool. So many NSYNC comments. I'm sorry. I'm sorry if I hurt you. I mean, I, I, I used to listen to NSYNC when I was like 16 or something, 17. Uh, so a lot of my older, I mean, older friends, a lot of my friends who are older, who are also used to listen to NSYNC would want, will, will once, one, one, once in a while will go to a, um, a karaoke room, or as it's known in Korea, a Noriban room, where we, you basically have a private room to sing songs. And literally the first song we always sing, literally, is Backstreet Boys. Yeah, Backstreet, Backstreet Back. That's, that's the song everybody loves here in, in South Korea. Because most of us are about the same age, and we're, we've been here for a while. Okay, cool. So uh, if you have any science-related questions, or if you want to find out more about the eclipse that you might have um, not understood, or if, if you missed some of the initial explanations from two hours ago, please make, uh, ask, ask the questions in the comments. I'm going to try to answer everything I can. Um, however, um, I am just going to also watch both screens here, so I might miss your question. I'm very sorry. Is that a sunspot? Uh, I think so. Yeah, that's a sunspot. Oh, so here's one important thing I forgot to mention. Um, 2024 and 2025 is literally the peak of solar activity, meaning that it's going to have the most sunspots, it's going to have the most uh, eruptions and uh, coronal mass ejections. And that means that we have a really high chance to see something absolutely impressive during the next hour, like a huge em ejection or a huge uh, emission from one of the um, sides of the sun. And that's kind of what a lot of scientists are hoping to see. That's why there are so many studies going on right now about the corona. And that sunspot is the sign of that activity. Um, and 2024, 2025 has been, so far has been one of the most active um, pe uh, peaks in terms of solar activity. So, so yeah, uh, it's super exciting for anyone doing helioscience, solar science. <laughs> when, when will I have a live karaoke stream? I'm, I don't want to kill you, I'm sorry. If there's anything that I'm really bad at, that's singing. That's why we have private rooms. You go to a private room, nobody can hear you. And yeah, you just do this with your friends and it stays that way. Kind of like Vegas. Um, my head is blocking the sun. I'm sorry. I'm removing my head. Here. I'm sorry. No head. And I'm not singing the song. I'm sorry. I'm not singing the song. There's no way. No. Mostly because my throat hurts <laughs> from all the talking and also from the uh, 
code that's coming on. Okay, so any any questions, leave them be, uh, below. And <clears throat> okay, here's a question. Uh, probability, uh, this is from uh, their flyer. Probability of a Carrington event. Soon, I guess, right? So e mm. <clears throat> let me come back for a second. I'm sorry, I'm going to block the sun again. Right now, according to studies that we have, um, it might happen in the next few decades, not anytime soon, but um, historically, there have been events that happen every few hundred years that seem to be even more powerful. And that is what worries everyone because we're not sure what's causing this. Um, and so, so basically, Carrington events or their equivalents or even more powerful events, which are known as the Miyaki events. Yeah, you can look it up on the, in the search on the channel, for example. There's quite a few videos on Miyaki events, M-I-Y-A-K-I. Um, those events are like ridiculous. They're 10 times more powerful. If they happen, we don't know what's going to happen to the technology we have. Uh, be, mostly because it's just such a ridiculously powerful emission that seems to be, affect everything on the planet. It aff even affects life in a sense because a lot of the trees that where we usually find the signs of these events start absorbing a lot of the radioactive carbon, which can only be formed during those events. And so, yeah, whatever happens, we don't want to know. And it might happen in the next few hundreds of years, or it might happen soon. So. That is why helioscience is still kind of important because there are so many un unanswered questions, so much uncertainty. <clears throat> um, what Catherine T, thank you for the donation. And the question is, what sort of eclipse is this? Like a blood moon. Um, the reason it looks that way, uh, the reason it looks like a blood moon is because of the filters they're using. They're basically um, covering a lot of the solar radiation so that we, go, we don't go blind. Um, and also because they're actually trying to see the sunspots. Oh, here, here's a better picture um, where you don't really see as much, right? So yeah, it's, it's just because it, they remove a lot of the brightness from the sun. Uh, and, okay, next. Blade J, thank you. For the donation and the question is is beetlejuice your second favorite star after the sun um beetlejuice is interesting but i mean there's i don't i wouldn't call it my favorite star i don't i don't i i like i like stars that are closer like proxima centauri is really exciting i would like to know more about it um beetlejuice though is it's overhyped okay it never went supernova it probably never will for a while i mean it will go supernova not not anytime soon um and it's it's interesting though. It does. It keeps doing interesting, unusual things. But um, yeah, definitely not as exciting as some of the other stars. Proxima Centauri though is exciting because not only is there, not only does it contain the nearest terrestrial planets, pl terrestrial planet to us, but that planet is also in the habitable zone, and it's very similar in size and mass to planet Earth. Now that is exciting. Um, so yeah. Uh, do I believe in material reductionist view of consciousness? I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with that. So I'm gonna say no. Uh, oh yeah, if it's in, re in regards to consciousness, video coming out about that eventually. I've been working on it for a few months. A lot of a lot of scientific papers that are super exciting. I wanna kind of like combine it all into one video. It's coming. Consciousness is an exciting topic. Um, oh, okay. So people are asking me to go in a corner. <laughs> Sit in a corner. You've been misbehaving, Anton. Go in a corner. Here we go. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, here we go. All right. So hopefully this is maybe better. Here, oh, just just this much. You get this much. Yeah, this is better, right? Let me know if this is better. I'm sorry I didn't think of it. Uh, I am in my 2:30 a.m. mine right now, so I'm I'm not thinking straight. Okay, so uh, let's see. <laughs> Someone, oh, Scott Crump. I've been watching your channel since it was What the Math. I'm grateful for how much effort you put it into it. Thank you so much, Scott. Um, yeah, What the Math uh, has gone away a few years back. It's been a while. 
Uh, it used to be called Water Math because I was a math teacher and I was actually making a lot of math videos for my students. Turns out they don't want to watch them. Not not super fun. So I started making Kerbal Space uh, uh, Kerbal Space Program videos because it had math in it. So I tried to like combine Kerbal Space Program with math to excite the students and to have them like play the game, figure out the orbits and stuff. And they're like, nope, not fun. And that led me to a lot of space videos that you you've been watching for the past years. That's kind of how it started, actually. Is it true that the edge of the solar eclipse is brighter than looking at the entire sun? Rumpelstiltskin. Um, I mean, no. What, what do you mean by entire sun? The sun itself is super bright. There's no way the edge can be brighter. Um, however, it is, it is going to be maybe just as bright as the sun, I guess. No, it's not, it's not going to be brighter than the sun. It cannot be. Um, but, hmm, now that you made me think about it, I'm thinking of uh, Einstein's theories of how the light bends. No, it's, it would not make sense. It's not going to be brighter. Um, okay, then, what age were my students? Uh, I actually taught every, every, every age. Uh, I'm basically qualified to teach anyone from six years old to 18 years old. Uh, so I started with the younger kids and then I taught middle school to high school. My last, last students from like, what, six years ago now, they were all high school students. So that's where Kerbal Space Program came in because a lot of them were struggling with math and they couldn't figure out certain concepts. So I'm like, okay, well, maybe I can explain it this way. And so they enjoyed the game and they liked it, but like, they didn't like the videos or the explanations. They just wanted to crash things, obviously. So there you go. You can actually find the whole Kerbal Space Program video playlist in one of the old. Part of the binary system causing processions of equinox. No, 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 it, it would be, it would be practically impossible. The telescopes we have today can literally detect a tiny, tiny brown dwarf, like 30 light years away, that barely produces any heat. So if there was any star in the vicinity that's able to exert enough gravitational strength on to create a binary effect, we would have seen it a long time ago. So no, practically impossible. Um, however, obviously there's that theory of, or I mean hypothesis, sorry, that maybe Planet 9 is real and also maybe Planet 9 is a black hole. So that's a different story though. And, and those, those effects, a lot of the effects we have in the solar system, such as different inclinations of various planets and different orientations, and even um, certain orbits, uh, especially for terrestrial planets, have been kind of explained with potential um, planet out there, planet nine. And that could be a black hole or a planet, but that's a different story. <laughs> Nasir FB is asking uh, a question that I guess I should answer. Personal question. 20 years ago, when you were 22 years old, do, what was I doing at 2 a.m. 2 a on a weekday? Um, I was still in college and I was probably studying because I was uh, pretty, uh, pretty diligent back then. Now I'm super lazy. Um, I, I pro okay, so I was probably cramming for one of the exams. Um, back then I thought that, you know, by studying super hard, by getting good grades, you get good job once you graduate and then you get hit with the reality truck once you graduate, because that's not really how it works. And so, yeah, I was trying to get good grades. I was probably studying and probably because I missed a class or something cause I was busy doing stuff. Um, but however, I was still having fun. Uh, Montreal, if you've never been, it's basically the best city to be a student in. So if you have like kids that are about to become college age and you have a chance to send them to Montreal, that's like the paradise for students. Uh, but for students only, you don't want to go there as an adult or as, as someone with a career because it's just really difficult. That's what I found as after I graduated. So I left Montreal because of the lack of career opportunities. Um, okay, next. Uh, okay, Planet 9, answer that. Uh, Nibiru, no, that's, Nibiru is not a real planet. It's Planet 9 could be real, but we don't know. 
could could dark matter explain uh, the effects from Planet Nine? I don't think so, but maybe no, no, probably not. It seems to be something really concentrated, and that cannot be dark matter. Dark matter would be more diffuse, um, unless it's you know not it's unlikely to be dark matter. Um, okay, thank you so much, Solar Knight, uh, for the donation and. Oh, Matej Steinhauser, uh, I missed a question. Should I be afraid of sun sending us back to ancient lifestyle by Carrington like event? And what is the likelihood of this terror? So that's the million, or oh, not a million, trillion dollar question. Is Carrington event going to send us back to the Stone Age? And I mean, there seems to be mixed, mixed opinions about it because on the one hand, we have studies that discover that only certain locations will be affected by very powerful um, events from the sun, very powerful uh, magnetic events. And those locations, uh, Quebec and Montreal are actually one of them. Uh, so part of Canada is, is going to be in a lot of trouble. Uh, and it seems to be in regards to conductivity of soil. But that's just one study, and that was just one discovery. We still have no idea because it hasn't happened in so long. Um, but I would say that it will be damaging, very damaging, but definitely not going to send us back because there are a lot of... Uh, uh, backups everywhere. There are a lot of systems that we have today that are kind of designed to withstand like an actual electrical discharge. So, and also it's mostly going to affect the cables, not like your, your smartphone, which I'm using right now to read some of the comments, uh, is probably going to be okay. I don't think electricity works in that way that it will be, I mean, the, the actual battery inside doesn't work that way. Uh, but the cables will suddenly have surges, and those surges can be pretty damaging. And I'm, maybe maybe banking system could be in trouble because a lot of it relies on a lot of cables. Also, Bitcoin. I, I, I think that's going to be the end of Bitcoin. A lot of it is totally not ready. Um, okay. Uh, okay, Bandman is asking if sunglasses are going to work. No, no, don't use sunglasses. Sunglasses are not okay. You need to get the specialized filtery sunglasses that they usually sell specifically for solar eclipses. Um, or get like a, a mirror and make it dark and reflect the sun on the mirror and you'll see the eclipse that way. That way you'll maybe protect your eyes. But don't stare at it. It's like pretty dangerous. You won't notice it right away. You're not going to go blind right away. But over time, what happens is because of the damage from the so, uh, solar radiation, you'll start losing your um, retinal cells and you'll actually start getting a lot of, um, what do you call them, floaters. And after this, you don't know. It, it might completely disappear. Your, your vision might completely disappear. It's a very slow and very scary process from what I hear. Um, but I'm also getting old. I'm also getting those floaters. So it is scary. Okay, cool. Uh, Zul Katie, thank you so much for the one pound donation. Um, for some reason, it, rem it reminded me of that one pound fish that was viral a few years back. Okay, question with a big question mark. How does L3 point work if the planet is on the opposite side of the star? So with Lagrange points, it, if, if it's L3, it, it really basically kind of counterbalances the other planet and it can stay in a permanent, in theory, it can stay in a permanent orbit. Do I still have that open? Uh, it can stay in a permanent orbit um, pretty much indefinitely. There's no like, there's no special thing you need to do about planets in the um, L3 point, which is right here, this point right here. Oh, you, now I'm blocking the point, huh? Great, here we go. So here you can stay permanently, like there's nothing that's going to affect anything. Uh, because it's basically like you, you, you know, you draw a line and you have, it's a kind of like a, I guess a, uh, what's that called? A merry-go-round kind of. So they're both always on the opposite side uh, and, and they don't really affect each other. But surprisingly, so far, I don't think we found any objects in that point anywhere. I don't think. Mostly because of Jupiter, I think. Jupiter is really, really influential in our solar system. So it basically, it just bullies everyone. It doesn't allow anything anywhere except for in its own L4, L5 points. So only the L4, L5 points of Jupiter allow um, allow us to have objects in them. They're they're called uh, they're called uh, Trojans and Greeks. 
So usually we refer to those objects as Trojans, um, but yeah. Hey, someone else from Montreal said Sky Trestiel. I'm sorry, I mispronounced your name. Trestiel. Um, I'm in a 92% totality. Can I take a quick glance? So I'm going to say no because that's what I learned the hard way <clears throat> back in 2008. <clears throat> My apologies. Back in 2008, I, I saw a partial solar eclipse and I kind of looked at it through a CD. And almost right away, I felt a burning sensation in my eyes. So just don't don't do it. Um, yeah, it's 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 still dangerous. It's it's just like you're basically staring at the sun. It's only eight percent, but it's still pretty bright. Yeah, if you have a, wheel, a welded mask, you can use that. A welded mask will protect you. <clears throat> um, do I need a filter to watch it on on YouTube? No, you're okay. I, I filtered it for you. You're good. Uh, okay, someone is asking about Flat Earth. No, I'm not interested. I'm sorry. Flat Earth is just... Don't have time. People believe in all kinds of stuff. There's too too many theories and ideas that sometimes are not worth mentioning. Um, and when, when, that, when the evidence goes against everything that we know, that just no point. Uh, yeah. I was going to mention something else about it, but it's, it's just... Uh, there's a much better channel that does this. Uh, oh my God, what's his name? The other science guy, uh, mm, Dr. Dave, is that his name? He does all the flat earth dis, um, disproval videos. He does all kinds of conspiracy theories. He does such a good job. That's basically his expertise. I mostly, m my, my goal right now is just to learn as much as we can about what we're actually discovering and then share it with everyone else. I'm mostly interested in actual discoveries and actual science. Not so much into hypothetic hypotheticals or unusual theories that just maybe don't make sense. Even that video that I made about LK99 superconductor, that was already kind of pushing it. Although there might be one coming out really soon because there's been some updates. Um, fun story, I because I'm in South Korea and those researchers were also from South Korea, I tried to visit their place and I almost got arrested. Uh, they... They don't want anyone there, and they, they know people that have been people have been harassing them. I actually just wanted to ask them a few questions and maybe see the sample, but they basically kind of almost called the police on everyone who was there. So yeah, it, it's with with any kind of a hypothetical, even sort of controversial theory or idea, it, it's hard. You have to be careful. Okay, David Vega, bravo! Thank you for the donation. And the question is, how do I foresee humanity in hundred years from now? Hmm, good question. And an important question for me because I do have kids, and I want them to be in a in a in a good place in hundred. I mean, my kids are going to be old, but yeah, their grandkids, my grandkids, their grandkids as well. Uh, so, hmm, humanity. Good question though, but I don't. Re so, okay, so here's where I am. Right now, I see that a lot of us are headed in a slightly maybe um, more negative direction, mostly because of the social media and what's being promoted, what's being echoed everywhere. You know, I ideas that are potentially dangerous and potentially detrimental. Um, and a lot of things that you see that go viral usually, unfortunately, are not good. Like, they're just not going to help anyone. However... It's only been a few decades uh, since the social media became so prominent. So I think we might change. We might, we might improve ourselves, especially if we start seeing the effects you know, from all kinds of different global changes around us, political changes, climate changes, you name it. Um, those might help us awaken a little bit. For now, though, I think we're doing stupid stuff, like especially in the last few years. There's a lot of stupid stuff going on. But you know, that's, that's humanity in a nutshell. We make mistakes and we fix them and we basically... Um, go in circles. It's our, it's our thing. We, we do circles. And then every circle will kind of come back a little bit higher. So maybe we'll get better in 100 years. Or maybe we'll go back to being a little bit less advanced. At this point, it's really hard to predict. Uh, you know, th this year, these last, these last few years, they've actually been so critical for a lot of things in, in, you know, in human history, especially you know, with the war going on, with uh, governments reshuffling here and there, you know, we just had that, uh, inv uh, not invasion, but what is it? Uh, the, the Mexico and Ecuador started fighting with 
something um, the embassy got basically invaded. Um, so things like that happen once in a while. And then we usually reach stability for a while. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. But I think in 100 years, we'll probably be stu still be doing a lot of stupid stuff, but um, maybe uh, not, not as advanced as we think we're going to be. I don't think we're going to advance as much. Um, all right. Next. Uh, Matesh Steinhauser. Thank you so much again. Um, I need multiple smart people to get some balance. Living like 50 BC to 1,000 years was ancient dystopia, and I live in Europe, so. Okay, well, that, okay. N there's no question, so I'm not going to answer it. But yeah, we all need balance in life, obviously. And I think that's, that's the thing. We're going to reach our balance at some point. It's just not going to happen in the next few years. I think there's going to be a lot of chaos for the next few years until something like really bad happens and then we'll probably smarten up again. That's how, that's how we usually learn. When something really bad happens, suddenly we smarten up. Anyway, next question. Uh, will the speed of expansion of the universe reach infinite speed? Well, okay, it, it's, it's, right now it's expanding faster than we can see it, faster than the speed of light at the edges, right? So it's already kind of at that, inf okay, it's not infinite speed, but it's faster than we can imagine it, faster than the speed of light. Um, ah, okay, maybe you're asking if you actually can reach a speed where it's super, super fast, like even beyond the speed of light. The answer to that is probably no, because currently the models predict that there's maybe a chance that the universe will possibly start contracting as well, or will just keep expanding at, uh, as, it's, as it's expanding right now. Um, and essentially what, what you can only imagine here is the observable universe. And the observable universe will always be expanding at the speed of light at the edges. It's never going to have higher speed than that. And that's basically the, the limit that we have. Ooh, that's a really, that's a really good uh, shot. But as you can see, Mexico is a little bit cloudy, huh? I wonder if, if people are able to see this because this is from a Na NASA, oh no, sorry, this is from Exploratorium. That's from uh, one of the, I guess it's a government uh, observation. Anyway, moving on. Um, someone from Vancouver, overcast and raining. Well, that's Vancouver, first of all, but also Vancouver is not gonna be getting this, unfortunately. Wrong location, but yeah. Um, I kind of wonder if the, if the um, conditions in most Canada might be not ready for the, for the eclipse. Usually around this time, there's a lot of clouds. Um, if, here's a question from Cheryl Baker. If you could be any celestial body from black hole to stars or planets, what would you choose to be? Neutron star. Uh, I don't know, I'm just fascinated with neutron stars. There was that uh, famous science fiction story about a, a neutron star that the scientists discover and they try to orbit it. And so they start to study the surface and they discover that on that neutron star, there is actually life. Uh, it was a science fiction story. Uh, and then, but because it's a neutron star, everything evolves like super, super fast. And so within just a few orbits, the life has advanced so much that it basically starts to communicate with the scientists and then it, it overcomes them in technology. And I think it helps them escape the neutron star. I think that that's the, that's the conclusion. I don't remember the end for that. It's a short story. Um, but yeah, neutron stars are awesome. It, neutron stars are basically the limit of physics that we know. Uh, it's like on the surface, you have the limit of um, physics we understand really well. As you go deeper inside, that's, it becomes all quantum. And at some point you reach the um, inner side and the center of the neutron star. And that's when you really like, we have no idea what's going on. The, the, there's, there are simulations, there are um, uh, predictive models, but none of them can actually explain exactly what's happening inside neutron stars. Uh, okay, Sven, no, don't use CDs and DVDs. Do not use CDs or DVDs to look at the sun. It's not gonna, it, it filters it a little bit, but it, the actual um, dangerous light is still gonna go through. I mean, obviously you're not gonna go blind, but you may damage your vision. Don't use CDs. Also, those of you asking or saying, uh, asking if it's okay to use a phone camera, you can destroy your phone camera too. I mean, if you have a phone you don't need, you can basically record it, but there's a high chance it's not gonna, the camera is not gonna work after. Um, 
Oh, okay. Teroki, thank you for the donation. And the question is, where is James Webb Telescope parked in terms of Lagrange points? It is located. It is located in uh, here. I'll show you. Oh, you can see it. It's right here. O2. It's the point away from the sun. Mostly because it's obviously you're looking away from the sun and also sometimes you get the shadow from the earth. So yeah, it's L2. What's going on on this stream? Okay, cool. That's a NASA stream. So people are, oh, is this Niagara Falls? Looks like Niagara Falls. Um, I heard that Niagara Falls declared emergency because of the amount of people that might be visiting. And I, yeah, I, I wouldn't, I would not want to be there right now. Um, cool question. Is life a cosmic fluke? Honestly, based on what I think right now, yeah. And not because of like number of stars out there or number of galaxies, just biologically. It's once you start, so my actual first experience with science was uh, biochemistry and microbiology. And one of the reasons I was having so much trouble with it in the first year was because I just could not understand the complexity. It was just way too complex. So, you know, you, you take a single protein, uh, for example, the most common protein, uh, like something that produces photosynthesis, for example, um, uh, Rubisco. Wait, no, Rubisco is not photosynthesis, sorry. Rubisco is responsible for uh, production of sugars, I believe. Anyway, so Rubisco is one of the most common proteins on the planet. It's not a complex molecule. It's like 100 something, no, 200 something pieces in it or um, amino acids. But once you start putting them together like Legos, there are so many combinations that it, it reaches astronomical, not even the right word, cosmological numbers, even more than, there are, there are more ways you can put a protein um, into one than there are stars and galaxies and planets in those stars in the entire universe. And that's just the structure. And then you take that and it has to become three dimensional because proteins, they have to fold. And that also adds another complexity. So just the fact that you have this structure formed here on the planet makes it super, super rare. It's, that's why I still think that we might never really be able to find even the life on you know, other planets, other stars. Uh, it might be super, super challenging. It, it's just right now the actual biological numbers seem to win over any cosmological numbers. Now, it doesn't mean that, you know, you, you always hear comments from, you know, intelligent design, whatever, or this is the proof of God. That's actually the opposite. It's literally, it literally showed us how extremely by chance we are here. And that chance can also be used to then calculate maybe the size of the universe. Because if we are here and the chance is this much, then you can actually maybe figure out what the total universe is like. Um, because maybe we are the only life. But that's just like, you know, that's based on biology. So if you, if you actually do talk to a lot of biochemists and bi microbiologists who have studied mo um, molecular structures for you know, decades, a lot of them often come to this conclusion too. They, they'll say, okay, yeah, there's a very, very small chance that we're gonna find this elsewhere. You know, it's super, super rare. But that's just you know, based on what we know now. The only, the only way we can answer this is by going somewhere. Like for example, Europa, Titan, um, even Mars. Uh, and if we find something that's similar, but different, now that's a different story. That means that, yeah, you can have life elsewhere, and that means that it changes everything. You can have life formed in a different location. It maybe has, maybe there's some kind of a pressure from the universe to have life. So yeah, it's, it's the only way to answer this question. Right now, it's all completely hypothetical. Hypothetical. Oh, getting tired. I need a drink. Oh, okay, good question, Scott McPherson. What about panspermia? So that's the only way we can maybe have a life elsewhere, I think, if it's been delivered from somewhere to somewhere. Now, we don't know if life on Earth is from somewhere else, um, but it might have left Earth and might have sell, settled somewhere else, for example, Mars, for example, I don't know, other planets, other, other moons. So panspermia is a possibility, but we don't, we don't have enough experiments right now to know exactly how long something can last inside an asteroid. Um, like for example, when it comes to DNA, we know that it kind of falls apart within maybe like a million years, maybe two million, um, and then it becomes completely like you cannot repair it anymore. anymore. And especially if you have you know, 
radiation from uh, from outer space, you have cosmic rays. It sort of completely disintegrates everything, and that makes panspermia challenging. And once again, the only proof we can have for this is by going to other moons, other planets. Well, really, the moons right now, moons of Jupiter, moons of Saturn, they're the best location we can maybe find something. And there are a few mission, uh, missions coming up. There is the uh, uh, Clipper mission that's going to be coming really soon. However, um, right now, we just don't really have, we don't, we don't know, nobody knows. Um, oh, oh, someone's asking me about Space Engine. Please show the, oh, look, look at this. Shadow of Earth Space Engine. So this is where it's currently located. This is a simulation in real time from outer space. And so you basically have a big chunk of Mexico in complete darkness, um, big part of California, and it's slowly moving toward Texas and other states. I'm gonna leave it here for a second. Um, cool, all right. Cubic region T, is it worth driving two hours to see the totality? I think it is, but I mean, it's the last one in like 20 years in North America. So unless you're gonna be traveling somewhere else to see it, um, I, I would do it. It's a once in a lifetime kind of event. You might be able to see it um, in Europe in a couple, in like three or four years, but you have to travel for that. Um, okay. Next, what did I miss? What did I miss? What did I miss? Uh, okay, here we go. Fermi paradox simulation. Okay, yeah, well, Arthur Eakin mentioned the simulation hypothesis. It's with a simulation hypothesis, I think um, there are so many ideas you can present here, but you know that idea that was kind of thrown around before where, okay, if we live in a simulation, there's really two options here. Either we are like the first, we're the first simulation um, because we haven't created one yet. We don't, we're not able to simulate the entire universe, just like the actual universe is. So that means that we are either the first ever so that we're not living in a simulation or we're basically like the last. Uh, and there are so many behind us, but that kind of would not make as much sense. So it's like a 50-50 chance, but kind of leans toward that we're not in a simulation. Basically, the, the more likely response here is that we're probably not in one. And and it's such a philosophical question. There's really currently no answer to answer this, and uh, no, no way to answer this. But there was that experiment that someone tried to conduct by by doing the uh, double slit experiment uh, with, with the lasers. And I, I don't think they had they got a definitive answer out of it. So yeah, right now I think we're, we're in a real world, so you should probably go to work tomorrow, go to school, don't skip. But we'll talk more about this later. I actually, I'm looking forward to the uh, feedback on that particular study. I want to come back and talk more, more about it in a separate video. We'll talk about the entire thing. All right, let's go back to the actual, ooh, look at that, it's almost there. Ooh, that's cool. Oh, it looks beautiful. Let me see if I can, maybe I can, here we go. <clears throat> this is better. So I think in like maybe a minute or so in Mazatlan, Mexico, we're going to be seeing the eclipse. Um, and okay, Poo Pap is asking, can we introduce life to other planets? Yeah, that's definitely possible. Life in other, on other planets, I don't think would be impossible if we introduce it. But you know, it's we still can't. We don't know how to get out of get out as even. We don't even know how to get to the moon yet. So, I mean, we do, but it's so difficult now with the politics and the economics. Um, all right, so this is actually, this reminds me of something I wanted to mention. Um, the, the Mayans were also terrified of this, obviously. That's why they had the entire calendar created. And the um, Mayan solution to the solar eclipse, so they believed this was like a battle between the god of the sun and the gods of the moon, or the moon was the god and the sun was the god. And so they, um, they essentially solved this by uh, blood sacrifice. So they killed people. They thought that by providing blood during this eclipse, they would uh, allow the sun god to re regain his power 
and to essentially come back to life. John Nash, okay, thank you so much uh, for the donation. And the question is, why do planets revolve around their star system on the same general plane, and what causes that plane? Um, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to see if I can. Oh, okay, I'll show I'll show you I'll show you in a, in a few seconds. I'll come back to this question in in, um, in a few minutes after after the eclipse. Because I'm re I really hope we can see the um, during the totality. I, I really hope we can see the beads, Bailey's beads, and also the uh, the corona as well. So almost there, like a few, few seconds, a minute, half a minute. This is beautiful. This is gorgeous. But yeah, just to quickly answer the question, uh, the planets revolve in the same plane and, and the galaxy do, galaxies do as well because it creates the least likely, um, so in terms of momentum, especially angular momentum, it, it creates the least resistance for the momentum. It, it, it basically, it's the most efficient way for something to rotate and to spin. Um, and it's really more of a study on how particles find the best um, rotation. Uh, okay, I really didn't explain this well. I'm probably gonna, I'm, I'm gonna try to show you if I find a picture after this. But this is gorgeous. Now I'm, now I'm really, um, oh, oh no, come back. Now I'm really disappointed I didn't get to go. I, I wish I could see this in real life. So almost there. And I bet this place in Mexico is filled right now. It's the first place to experience it. It. And it was explained by a scientist approximately 200 years ago, and his name was Dr. Beads. So it's known as, B uh, oh, sorry, his, his name was Dr. Bailey, so he's known as Bailey's Beads. Dr. Beads is going to be my name if I become a doctor. Um, yeah, someone is mentioning the comet. Um, I don't think they're looking for the comet. Because the comet would be in a different location in the night skies. And this particular stream is focused specifically on, on the sun and the moon. Um, therefore, we don't get to see it. However, if someone does catch it, I'm going to try to make a video about it and show the... Okay, that's a different location in Mexico. Um, I'm going to show the picture or something of the, of the comet if someone, if someone does man manage to capture it. But it's not next to the sun right now, so you're not going to see it that close. So basically, we're probably going to see this a few times now. Uh, it, we're going to be seeing different locations. But those of you who want to just see it once, it's, it's done. That was the first location in North America that got to witness the event. Um, I think um, Texas starts in about like half an hour no, no less than that, sorry 20 minutes but I want to check what they have on the other stream, there's another stream from the National Science Foundation I'm going to check if they have a better if they have a slightly better uh, camera or 
possibly a slightly better angle. If I can find it. Fun fact that I forgot to mention. Eclipse is from uh, Greek, eclipses, and uh, it basically means to fail or to fail to appear. Also means to leave. And so back in the days, uh, the Greeks were scared of this event because they felt abandoned by the gods. So they named it the abandonment, the, the, the leaving of the gods. That's why we call it the eclipse. And it lasted, that, that belief lasted for a long time. Obviously, Ma Mayans thought something similar. The Icelandic people, the, um, a, lot of, a lot of European cultures believed something similar. And that changed in the 17th century when, when Newton came in and said, nope, we have planets, we have stars. Um, actually, it was not technically Newton, it was Edmund Halley. Uh, Halley Halley's Comet is named after him. Um, and he, he was able to kind of explain a lot of things and even predict the first solar eclipse in England. So he became famous for that as well. But today we're so much better at predicting this. We can actually predict eclipses in approximately 10,000 years from now. Not that anyone's going to be around. That, who cares, probably. Or maybe, we, maybe we'll be around, but we just... By then we won't care about eclipses anymore. So it's interesting how in just 400 years we went from being absolutely terrified of these to basically knowing exactly what they are and being able to predict them to exact second. Okay, let me see if I can disable the sound here. And what does Ni National Science Foundation show us? Okay, so in case you're wondering, National Science Foundation still has explanations. And they're mostly talking about the same stuff we've talked about. But no actual, um, no actual eclipse yet. All right, cool, cool, cool. Oh, here we go, one more time. Number, number two. Oh, this one looks, this one actually looks a little bit better. The cameraman here is maybe a little bit more experienced. Well, you get to see the slightly different view of this. This is in color too, I think. Wow, this is this is gorgeous. Oh, they changed the wow, they changed the brightness again. That's awesome. This looks amazing. But still no prominence. You, you see a little bit of corona, but no prom prominences would be like these filaments sticking out everywhere, which are produced by the magnetic emissions from the sun. I don't really see them here, kind of. Maybe I'm missing it. So maybe we just basically got unlucky that the sun decided to be very, very quiet during the eclipse, even though this is the most active time for the sun. Whoa, this is so cool. This is, this is going to be the new thumbnail. <laughs> I'm removing the scary thumbnail and changing it to this. Oh, someone mentioned, okay, if I go to a website called Zoom Earth, they put real-time real -time satellite images. Okay, let's see. Zoom Earth, thank you. Uh, and your name was Garden of Una. Una. Let's see. Zoom Earth. Zoom that Earth. Oh, that's so cool. Okay, I'm gonna, for a second, I'm gonna change this to that. And this is the actual shadow um, from space. Let's compare it to what we have. This is the real shadow and simulated shadow. All pretty spot on. So yeah, this is really cool. Shows you the real shadow as it's seen from, from the outer, uh, from outer space, from the orbit. Okay, back to... Ooh, okay, there's nothing here. No, here we go. Thank you so much. This is a good site. So this is zoom.earth. Super cool stuff, though. Um, someone is asking, why isn't it round? Uh, if you're referring to corona, corona is not going to be round because the magnetic emissions from the sun are different depending on the location. 
if you're referring to the moon, it's almost round. I think it's almost a sphere. It, it's it's rugged. It has rugged surface, but it's spherical, more more or less. <laughs> My apologies. Um, someone is asking about the International Space Station. Um, I don't. We can, I mean, we can check the location right now, but they, they orbit planet Earth every 90 minutes. So they'll see, they'll see it. They'll see some of it. They'll see the shadow. But honestly, they see so many, though. Because, I mean, this happens. Like, the total eclipse happens every 18 months. So they do see quite a lot. Come on. So close. Please, Corona. Prominent. Um, those of you asking me for the name of the music, this is from the NASA stream, so I, I'm sorry, I don't know. Not my music. But the what music I usually use, it's normally in the description somewhere. It's it's um, some of the music I use for, for for some of the videos. Most of it is actually free on YouTube if you have YouTube music. Okay, so it's disappearing, and we get to see the lens. <laughs> Beautiful. So, I think they're trying to adjust the camera right now. Which I guess is a time for me to say hello, wonderful person. Those of you tuning in. Oh, here we go. What is this? The prophecy of Mayans came true. The sun is gone. Yeah, I, I like I mentioned, this is probably so stressful right now. Oh, wow. Okay. Here it comes. <laughs> it was worth the wait. That is a really cool shot. That is absolutely gorgeous. Wow. I, am I blocking this? I don't think I am. Well, yeah. So the, a little bit of prominence, but not as big as I thought it would be. You get to see the corona and you get to see activity around the sun. And it switched to another stream, I guess. Okay. Well, we'll probably come back. Uh, they'll probably come back to um, Dallas after they figure out the camera problems. Oh, here we go. Yeah, someone mentioned this looks like a black hole sun. It really does. It looks super cool. Kind of like what you expect a black hole to look like, but not really. And as some of you may know, this is exactly how they discovered that, you know, the theory behind black holes, the Einstein's theories of relativity, are actually true. Because right now, we can't really see the stars here, but the stars, if you could see them, they would be in a slightly different location to where they usually appear because the light, uh, no, sorry, because the gravity from the sun is bending the light just enough to move them by just like a one to two degrees. So like if there was a star that we could see here somewhere, if you look at it again um, in a few months, it, it would be in a different location. Uh, where is this? This is Dallas. So once again, you get to see a little bit of Bailey's beads, or a bead, one bead, and that is it, but still gorgeous. Those of you asking about, about my voice, uh, so this is after four hours of streaming and also cold. So yeah, if I sound rough, that's because of that. I do have a sore throat, unfortunately, I'm sorry. 
that's what you get for having a lot of kids in your life. Uh, this is no, this is not a flare. This is uh, Bailey's bead, which is um, essentially a, a light from the sun passing through various formations on the surface of the moon. So, like mountains, ridges, little hills. And as it passes through it, it creates these very cool formations. They're, they're known as Bailey's beads. They're always different. It depends, really depends on the location and the sun and the light. But yeah, they're, they're all, you can always see them during the total eclipse. And here it comes, it's coming out. Super cool, super cool. Um, those of you who watched the eclipse in real life, super jealous. One day I'll join you as well. But we're definitely coming back in a few months from now. And but I'm going to do another stream on, 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 on a different topic. And hopefully by then I'm going to be in a good condition, not super sick like I am today. Anyway, thank you for watching. Oh, this is cool. This is from India, uh, Indianapolis. Thank you for watching and stay wonderful. I'll see you tomorrow in 27 hours in the video about three body problem and aliens and extraterrestrial life, if it exists or doesn't. And we're going to talk about the dark forest hypothesis at some point too. Bye-bye and stay cool and stay safe. Don't look at the sun. I know you tried to. Don't look at it. It's not good for you. Okay, bye.